Her emotions had also returned to normal, and nothing about her seemed out of the ordinary as she was still very respectful to him. After three days, Kingsley had also returned to his most cold-blooded state. It seemed like the unhappiness that happened between the two of them three days ago was gone. The assassins took Kingsley's private jet and rushed to Southampton City. Jean looked out of the window at the white clouds outside the cabin and was a little lost in thought. Yu Jiayi sat down beside her and just looked at her conflicted expression. It was obvious that Jean would have to abandon all of her worries this time. This time, Jean would not have a choice of her own. On Wednesday, the news of the Sanders wedding spread like wildfire in Southampton City, and the attention finally shifted away from Cardellini Pharmaceutical. That was probably why the Sanders marriage was a little rushed. Logically speaking, a wedding of such a large scale like the Sanders should have been announced half a year in advance. It was rare to hold a wedding ceremony only a week after the announcement. However, it had to be said that the Sanders' actions had attracted everyone's attention. It was also because they did not want too many people to focus on Cardellini Pharmaceutical as it would be harmful to them. After all, they had suffered a huge setback due to Cardellini Enterprise. However, if there was another chance next time, they would still take Cardellini Enterprise for themselves. It was only a matter of time. At that moment, Monica was sitting in her office, also reading some news about the Sanders wedding. She used to love to gossip, but now, it was not as fun anymore. She put down her phone and continued with her work aimlessly. In Bamboo Garden in the Swan's residence, Edward was dressed very formally. Knox had also arrived. The two of them were prepared to set off to the Sanders residence to attend Stacy and William Gates's wedding. When it was time to leave, Edward turned to George, whom he deliberately did not allow to go to school today, and said, I will bring your mother back tonight. George did not believe him. He had a feeling that his mother would not come back. So be good at home. However, George did not refute Edward. He always felt that his father felt even more uneasy than he was when it came to his mother. Edward patted George's head before leaving with Knox. Today, there would definitely be a bloodbath. The Sanders would definitely not be able to hold back. Edward and Knox sat in the car, and the both of them were a little too serious. Knox was not someone who could keep things to himself. Hence, he turned to Edward and asked, isn't the old master going? He was asking about Zachary Swan. After all, the invitation had made it very clear to invite both old master Yen and Edward to Stacy's wedding. If old master Swan did not go, would he not be disrespecting the Sanders? Would you still want to go up the mountain knowing that there's a tiger there? Edward replied coldly, the only reason I'm attending the wedding is to start a war. He had no thoughts about dealing with the Sanders again. In fact, it was time it ended. Knox did not say anything more. In any case, he only needed to carry out Edward's orders unconditionally. By the way, Knox suddenly thought of something. Will Jean will be there today? She should be. She would probably be there to kill you, Knox said bluntly. I know, Edward replied, but she can't do it. How can you be so sure? Knox looked at Edward. He was really afraid that the guy would not die in the hands of the Sanders but in the hands of Jean. I believe in Jean. I don't. Knox enunciated each word. So, if she really threatens your life, I won't go soft on her. To Knox, his mission in life was to protect Edward. No matter who it was, he could not allow her to threaten Edward's life. She won't, Edward confirmed. Tonight, he was determined to bring Jean back to his side no matter what. Never again would he be away from her. The car slowly drove into the Sanders residence. At the door, 
the Sanders security guards stood in a row. Everyone who entered the Sanders residence would be thoroughly searched. Moreover, those whose names were not on the invitation card were not allowed to enter. Thus, Knox could only wait outside. Edward walked into the Sanders residence alone. There were not many wedding decorations inside, and it did not look too grand. It was obvious that the Sanders wanted to keep a low profile in that aspect. Edward was led by the staff to the Sanders Ceremony Hall. Not many people in the hall as there were only about 30 chairs. At that moment, only a dozen or so people were at the scene, all of whom were political officials of the Sanders. Other than Edward, the rest of them were not businessmen. In fact, businessmen did not have the right to attend the Sanders wedding. The Swans were there because Zachary was instrumental in helping the Sanders build the nation. The Sanders had always been grateful, so naturally, they would treat the Swans differently. Edward sat there calmly. The number of people in the ceremony hall gradually increased. However, no one was talking to each other. Everyone looked serious as if they were not here to attend a wedding but to have an important meeting. Fourth Master Swan In the hall, a staff member appeared respectfully in front of Edward and said in a low voice, The leader is asking for you. Edward glanced at the staff. Then, he got up and left with the staff without any hesitation. They passed through the courtyard of the residence and walked toward a building that was more heavily guarded than any other place. Edward was asked to wait outside. After the staff member went in to report, he came out and said, Fourth Master Swan, please come in. With that, Edward walked in. There were many guards inside. In fact, they were everywhere, which made the atmosphere seem overly strict and quiet. He passed through a central room and entered a study. In the study, Warren stood in front of his table, writing calligraphy. He looked calm and relaxed. After the staff brought Edward there, he left respectfully and even closed the door for them. Edward turned around. Slowly, he said respectfully, Leader. Take a seat. Warren was writing seriously with the pen in front of him. His attitude toward Edward was friendly and casual. Edward did not dare to disobey Warren's orders, so he nodded and said, yes. He sat on the mahogany sofa next to Warren, and there were some tea sets on the coffee table in front of him. Warren said, a minister went to the Gilead for some networking. When he left, the other party gave us two boxes of Gilead specialty tea leaves. I haven't tried them yet. Would you like to be the first to try? Sure. Edward picked up the teapot and poured himself a cup. Warren's writing hand paused for a moment as he turned to look at Edward, who drank the cup of tea without any hesitation. After that, he turned back and continued to write seriously. Gilead's black tea lives up to its reputation. When the tea enters the mouth, it is refreshing and rich. There is a sweet aftertaste in your throat, and it also moistens the throat, Edward commented. Is that so? Warren stood up straight and examined the calligraphy he had just written. Then, he slowly put down his pen and walked over. Edward hurriedly stood up, showing his respect. Warren seemed very easygoing. Please sit. After Warren sat down, Edward followed suit and quickly poured a cup of tea for Warren. Warren picked it up and tasted it slowly. As he tasted it, his expression relaxed, showing that he was satisfied with the tea leaves. He put down the teacup and nodded. Good tea indeed. Edward poured Warren another glass. Warren said, Edward, aren't you curious why I wanted to see you alone? At that moment, he could not help but admire the man in front of him for being so calm. Was the man really afraid that he would kill him now or that he had poisoned the tea? You must want to ask why my father isn't here. 
Edward found an excuse that would not make the situation awkward. Warren took the teacup and took another sip. He listened to Edward, who explained in a respectful voice, my father hasn't been in good health recently. His rheumatoid symptoms have been acting up, and he has difficulty moving his legs. The doctor recommended that he rest in bed and walk in moderation. That's why he specifically told me to attend the wedding on his behalf. He also told me to apologize to you in person. Old Master Swan is too polite. Of course, his health is more important. Make sure your father takes good care of his health. Warren had an affable look on his face. Thank you for your understanding, leader. I'll definitely go back and pass on the message to my father. Yes. Warren nodded. After that, he put down his teacup and said, One reason I called you here is to ask about your father, but the other reason is. Edward did not react strangely to it. Even though Warren deliberately hesitated to speak, Edward respectfully waited for him to continue. Warren said, that year my father passed away, he reminded me that the Swans was a family of loyal officials. If it weren't for the Swans held back then, the Sanders wouldn't have been able to develop so far. Hence, he told me to treat the Swans well. However, because I've been too busy with national affairs all these years, I've neglected my father's will. Thinking about it now, I even feel guiltier. Leader, you're too kind. A country needs a leader, and of course, national affairs are the most important thing for a leader. Moreover, my father has long since abandoned politics and joined the business industry. For you to give my father a piece of land to develop his business, my family is already extremely grateful, and we don't ask for anything more. His words had several layers of meaning. It expressed the Swan's determination to no longer participate in political affairs, and it also showed that the Swans wanted stability and had no other ambitions. Warren naturally understood that. He laughed out loud. Don't worry. I know that the Swans have always been loyal. It was also a reminder to Edward that he was well aware of what the Swans were hiding. Well. Warren immediately changed the topic. Someone has been reporting to me recently that the Duncans still have an heir. I wonder if you know anything about this, Edward. I don't know anything, Edward said firmly. Apparently, he has grown up under the nurturing of the Duncans' loyal men from the previous ruling and already has his own power. He is also eager to make a move on us. If this person really exists, I believe that after so many years, even if the Duncans have that idea, it would only be a thought. Looking at the history of Harkin, there has never been a case of rebellion. So, you don't need to worry too much, leader. As long as we find this person and execute him, we can settle the country's dispute. I think you're right, but it's just that, Warren looked at Edward intently. I still don't know who this person is. As long as this person is in Harkin, it won't be too difficult for you to find him. Unless, Edward looked back at Warren. There is no such person and someone is deliberately instigating the situation and deliberately interfering with the Sanders politics. Edward, do you think that there is no such person? I'm just assuming. Warren's eyes narrowed. There were no loopholes in Edward's answers. Every answer did not deny his suspicions, nor was it certain that it was the truth. Moreover, he had completely cleared his name. Warren said, I originally wanted to ask your father today. After all, your father was in power back then and was familiar with everyone under the Duncan's influence. If we investigate them one by one, we might be able to find the existence of the Duncan's descendant faster. My father has been in business for many years and is now over 70 years old. He may not remember many things that happened when he was younger. However, if you need anything, I can call my father now and ask him directly. 
As Edward said that, he was about to make a call. Forget it. Warren stopped him. Of course, he knew that he would not be able to get anything out of Zachary. Your father's health is more important. Besides, as you said, your father might not remember after so many years, so I won't disturb his rest. Thank you for your understanding, leader. From the start, Edward was extremely respectful. Edward, Warren called out to him. Yes, leader. From my point of view, regardless of the existence of the Duncan's descendant, I must get all the facts right. However, I'm in a predicament now because I've put in so much effort and spent so much manpower and resources only for the result to end up ambiguous. It's been making it hard for me to sleep. It must be hard on you, leader. It is indeed. Warren said, on one hand, I have to deal with national affairs, and on the other hand, I have to consider the existence of this descendant. On top of that, I have used some of the country's resources to find this person's whereabouts. I feel a little guilty for wasting so much on personal matters. So, I have a presumptuous request that I would like you to help me with, Edward. As you command, leader. Edward agreed. I've heard that the Winters, which is your father's assistant, Wade's family, are now working for the Swans. I heard that his grandson is very capable and has a good network of connections. He also follows your orders. Leader, if you have something to say, just say it. I want to hand over the matter of finding the Duncan's descendants to you, Warren said. Edward's eyes moved slightly. He replied, as a member of Harkin, I naturally have the responsibility to share the leader's worries, so I won't reject your request of me. However, Knox isn't as capable as people say, and the Winters aren't as powerful as the rumors say. I can only do my best, but I can't guarantee that I can give you a satisfactory result. That's not important. All I ask is that you put some effort into it. Warren made himself clear. I just don't want to waste too much of my time. I should have more time to deal with national affairs. Yes, Edward replied respectfully. It's my honor to be able to share your burden. Warren patted Edward's shoulder and said, I'll leave it to you then. I'll definitely do my best, Edward promised. Then, Warren nodded. It's getting late. The wedding is about to start. Edward quickly stood up from the sofa. In that case, I shall not waste more of your time. Edward, Warren called out to him again the moment he left. Edward was still very respectful. I won't mistreat you for helping me. Warren said, you'll know that the Swans and the Sanders are actually one family. Thank you, leader. You may leave. Warren waved his hand. With that, Edward left Warren's study. After leaving, a man walked out from behind the screen in the study. It was Warren's eldest son, Chester. Warren would naturally do his best to groom Chester, who was the heir to the throne. Father. Chester appeared to be very respectful. Edward is not a simple person indeed. Even under our threats and temptations, he did not lose his composure. So, it won't be easy for us to touch him. Warren's expression turned cold. The fact that he came to our residence alone with such a domineering attitude today and even faced my conversation with a straight face is enough to show that he has the confidence to escape unscathed. It means that if we make a move today, we might end up in a situation that we can't control. Warren nodded. In that case, Chester did not know what decision to make. He knew that the Swans could already threaten the Sanders, so if the Swans were not eliminated, they would definitely become a great threat. However, if they were not eliminated properly, they would also become a great hidden danger for the Sanders. Right now, the Sanders were forced into a dilemma. We'll let them kill each other, 
Warren said viciously with a sinister look in his eyes. Father, you're saying. That's right. We still have a trump card. Warren sneered. Jean. Chester's expression turned cold. He knew that his father's plan would never go wrong. The Swans had planned everything, but never in a million years would they imagine that Jean was a daughter of the Sanders. Edward returned to the ceremony hall. At 11.18 a.m., the wedding ceremony began. Everyone quietly watched the overly procedural wedding in front of them. The clapping was done under the guidance of the staff. Every single reaction was instructed, and some were even a little too serious. Once the wedding ended, all the guests moved to the banquet hall in the Sanders residence. For a ceremony with 30 people, there were only three tables. Including the Sanders round table, there were four tables in total. The banquet hall was not gorgeously decorated and even seemed a little too simple. After everyone was seated, they waited for the meal to begin. Before dinner, Chester went up the stage to give his thanks on behalf of Warren. After all, Warren was the leader of a country. He naturally could not be too polite to subordinates, which would be beneath his status. Chester picked up the microphone and said to everyone seriously, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to my little sister and brother-in-law, Stacy and William's wedding. On behalf of the Sanders, I sincerely thank you for coming. The audience burst into applause and ended in the next second. My younger sister and my brother-in-law, Stacy and William, they, he then went on to tell their relationship history. Even though Chester's tone was a little too serious, at the very least, it was a blessing to the newlywed couple. Hence, it did not give the impression that it was an official statement by the Sanders. Lastly, I've been entrusted by my father to wish my little sister and my brother-in-law, Stacy and William, a lifetime of love and care for each other. He also hopes that they will not forget their purpose to repay the country and society. Here, I wish both of you a happy marriage. Another round of applause broke out. This time, it lasted for a slightly longer time, but it ended in an instant. Just when everyone thought that the toast was over, Chester stayed on the stage. He seemed a little emotional, which was different from the usual him. He took a deep breath and said, On this joyous day, the Sanders has a piece of good news that we hope to share with everyone. Everyone's attention was attracted by that sentence. Perhaps everyone was bored from following along with all the instructions during the wedding ceremony just now because, at that moment, their interests were piqued. After all, everyone knew about the wedding and knew that they had to go through the motions. However, no one knew about the other happy news. Some people started to wonder if Stacy was pregnant or... Of course, it did not seem like a good idea to announce her pregnancy at a wedding. Harkin was a country that took tradition very seriously. Although they did not reject a non-married couple from living together, living together after marriage was much preferred. As the rulers of Harkin, the Sanders naturally would not insult themselves like that. Just as everyone was deep in thought, Chester finally spoke. He announced loudly, the Sanders have a missing daughter, and she has returned. After he said that, the crowd was in an uproar as they were really surprised by that piece of news. What did he mean by that? Did the Sanders have a missing daughter? Did that mean that other than his five children, the leader had another child? Who was it? How could they be lost? Why was he or she back now? Everyone's mind was filled with questions until a figure walked onto the stage before everyone's eyes. She was wearing a light blue dress, which made her look like the daughter of a humble family. It was completely different from the feeling she gave off before. At that moment, she seemed to have restrained all her brilliance and have obediently become the lovely princess of the Sanders. She looked so pure and beautiful. 
Edward's eyes were fixed on her. He watched as the woman, who had disappeared from his side and had cruelly stood him up, appear in front of him again in a way that he could never have imagined. There was a distance of two tables between them, but from then on, it felt like they were separated by a mountain that could not be crossed. At the scene, everyone looked at Jean. They all knew her. After all, that woman had become extremely popular in Southampton City not long ago, and everyone knew who she was. Yet now, she went from rags to riches. Everyone was shocked, but no one dared to ask a single question. Chester said, back then, my father was assigned to investigate a huge incident that jeopardized the interests of the country. He made a mistake and was discovered by the other party. Fortunately, in the midst of danger, Jean's mother came to his rescue, and the two of them put on an act. However, we didn't expect that Jean would be left behind as a product of that act. If Jean's uncle had not told us the truth recently, we wouldn't have known that Jean was the daughter of the Sanders. Perhaps Jean's appearance will cause a lot of controversies, but for now, we have to give her a legitimate and bright identity. From now on, her name will be Jean Sanders. Jean Sanders. Edward's lips moved slightly as he muttered that unfamiliar name, Jean Sanders. Sanders. He just sat there and watched the Sanders welcome Jean. He looked at the faint smile on Jean's face and her eyes that did not fall on him for a second. We're very grateful to Jean's foster parents for raising her. Although they're no longer around due to some special reasons, I'd like to thank them on behalf of the Sanders, thank them for returning Jean to us in one piece," Chester said emotionally. In fact, the only reason he thanked Alexander Lawrence's family was so that the Lawrence enterprise would still be under the Sanders' control. Otherwise, according to the law, Jean was not Alexander Lawrence's biological daughter, so she had no right to inherit the Lawrence Enterprise Group. Besides Joshua and Jennifer, who were still alive and had been brought to justice, there was still Jasmine, who could inherit Lawrence Enterprise. The Sanders did that only to show that they recognized Jean's identity, so it was not wrong for Jean to inherit Lawrence Enterprise. Jeannie's return means that. Our family has another in-law. Chester's voice was high and full of emotion as he looked at Edward. Can we please invite Edward on stage? The audience burst into applause. Edward's eyes moved slightly. Without any hesitation, he stood up and walked up to Jean's side under everyone's watchful eyes. Jean looked down, and their eyes did not meet. Chester said to Edward, when you and Jeannie got married, we didn't know Jeannie's identity. But now, as Jeannie's elder brother, I hope you accept this belated blessing. Thank you. Edward appeared to be very respectful. Chester patted Edward's shoulder in relief before taking Jean's hand. Jean's fingers moved slightly. Then, Chester placed Jean's hand into Edward's. Edward subconsciously held Jean's hand pretty tightly. Jean felt a little pain, but she did not show it on her face. I'll leave my sister in your hands. Treat her well, Chester said. I will. Edward nodded. I think my father saw you alone before the wedding just now and has told you everything, so I won't say much. However, I'll add that Jeannie has just returned to our family, and we'd like to spend more time with her. You should bring her back more often. From now on, the Sanders and Swans are one family, Chester said in a friendly manner. Yes, I'll definitely bring Jeannie back to the Sanders more often. Take her back to the banquet. My father is there, Chester instructed. Edward nodded and pulled Jean to the guest of honor seat. Of the three seats reserved, two were to Warren's right, and one was to his left. It was obvious that the two empty seats were reserved for Jean and Edward. Edward pulled out a chair for Jean like a gentleman and let her sit next to Warren before he sat down next to her. 
Warren looked at Jean lovingly. The moment Jean sat down, Warren reached out and held her hand tightly. He said gently, it's good that you're back. Jean smiled and replied, yes. Eat more, Warren said. Thank you, father, Jean replied. Edward sat at the side and listened to their conversation quietly. Although it was Stacy's wedding, Warren took care of Jean throughout the entire banquet. He was like a loving father of an ordinary family who doted on his daughter. The banquet did not last long, and there was no toasting session. Everyone ate in silence, and after they ate, no one left. However, once everyone in the main seats left, the guests were arranged to leave one after another. Instead of having entertainment, everyone was sent to a large tea room to have a chat and have some tea. Edward and Jean were sent to a bedroom in the Sanders house. It was a bedroom that only a member of the Sanders had. Warren had personally sent them over, and before he left, he said to Jean gently, you guys should get some rest. After dinner tonight, I'll get someone to send you back to the Swan family's manor. Yes, father, Jean said respectfully. Edward. Warren smiled at Edward. As I said, we're a family. Yes. Edward was also very respectful. Aren't you going to call me that too? Warren smiled gently. In fact, there was no way to resist, so Edward did not hesitate as he said, Father. Warren smiled in relief. Don't forget our agreement just now. I'll do my best. You guys haven't seen each other for a long time, so I won't disturb you guys any longer. Have a good rest. Take care, Father. When Warren left, Jean turned around and looked at Edward. She watched as his eyes stayed on Warren's back until Warren disappeared from his sight. Then, he turned around and met Jean's eyes. There were so many things they wanted to say, but nothing could come out of their mouths. He held Jean's hand, walked into the room, and closed the door. The room was huge. It was exquisitely decorated and looked very clean and tidy. The two of them stood in the room in silence. It was so quiet that they did not know how to break the silence between them, or rather, to break the ice on that long-awaited reunion. When did you find out? Finally, Edward spoke. He brought Jean to the sofa in the room as if he wanted to have a good talk with her. However, Jean did not answer him. Has it been long? Edward asked her. Have you known for a long time that you're Warren's daughter? You knew when you married me, didn't you? In fact, Edward already knew the answer when he asked her. Jean still chose to remain silent. However, the silence was a tacit agreement. After she had been saved by Kingsley overseas, he told her everything about her identity. He had told her about her mother's identity, the cause of her mother's death, and the existence of her biological father. It turned out that she really was not a member of the Lawrence family. She suddenly understood why the Lawrences had treated her that way. However, Kingsley had never been a good person. He told her that the Lawrences did not know that she was not their daughter, so the Lawrences were cruel to her in a fundamental sense. The cruelest thing was that he killed her mother with his own hands. She naturally had to come back to take revenge for that. Therefore, under Kingsley's arrangements, she learned a lot of self-defense skills and a lot of business deception. After learning it, she was sent back to Southampton City under an opportunity. Taking revenge on the Lawrences was only one of Kingsley's arrangements. The other was to help the Sanders take over the economic power of Harkin, which meant that she would first take over Lawrence Enterprise. After all, in everyone's eyes, she was still the daughter of the Lawrences. Hence, it was only natural for her to get the company, and of course, it would be easier for her. On the other hand, Kingsley and the Sanders had always kept in contact. 
Every year, the Sanders would spend a large sum of money to hire the Hills to do things for them. Back when the Sanders overtook the country, the Hills had also contributed to their success. For many years, they had been working together. Other than money, the Hills also needed the support of the Sanders' power, and the Sanders naturally needed the Hills to do many things that could not be exposed to the public. One example was helping the Sanders kill the descendant of the Duncans and wipe out all the forces of the Duncans. In fact, wanting Jean to marry Edward was one of the Sanders' orders. Jean did not have the right to refuse. From the Hill's perspective, she naturally could not reject the Sanders' request. After all, they needed to work together for both parties to benefit. From the Sanders' perspective, she could not reject their plan because she had the obligation to contribute to the Sanders' regime. Hence, she married Edward. On one hand, she could help the Sanders investigate whether the Duncan's descendant was related to the Swans. On the other hand, she could help the Sanders better control Harkin's economy. The Sanders had a good plan. They wanted her to use her beauty to win over Edward. In reality, it was impossible to succeed. After a few exchanges, Kingsley knew that Edward was already out of their control. In order to prevent Jean from being truly hurt, he thought of a way to bring her back, which completely destroyed his relationship with the Sanders and their plans for Jean. Furthermore, Jean had been helping Monica to stop the Sanders from making any other arrangements, so the Sanders had no choice but to send her back to the hills. If Michael had not failed completely, the Sanders might have given him a little more time. It was precisely because he had failed that all their schemes failed, and the Sanders started to lose their patience. The Sanders also knew that the descendant of the Duncans was powerful enough to threaten their interests, and that power was led by the Swans. The Swans were now in control of the Harkins' economy. Even after the Sanders had done so many shady things in the dark to destabilize the Swans' economic status, it was to no avail. In fact, it made them look like clowns, so they could only choose to take the risk. The best way was to make use of Jean's relationship with Edward. Once her identity as the daughter of the Sanders was revealed to the public, Edward and she would become complete enemies. In other words, Edward had to kill her. The Duncans would never allow Edward to marry the daughter of the Sanders or even have any feelings for her because that would threaten the trust that the Duncans had in the Swans. Everyone was afraid of switching sides. After all, the fall of an empire was always because of the rebellion of their subjects. Jean was well aware of the Sanders' wishful thinking, and Edward was too. In fact, even the Duncans might be aware of that. Everyone was aware of it, but they would just change their plans according to that. No one was willing to take risks or gamble with their emotions to assume who was loyal to whom. The room suddenly became silent again. Since Jean did not say anything, Edward did not say anything either. The two of them just sat on the sofa without saying a word. No one knew what would happen the moment they left the Sanders residence. I've thought about your identity, Edward said. In the room where the two of them were together, Edward spoke after a long time. But I never thought that you were Warren's daughter. Edward enunciated each word. She could have any identity, but she could not be Warren's daughter. Due to that identity, it would be impossible for them to be together in the future. In the quiet room, someone's phone suddenly rang. Jean lowered her head and looked at the small bag she had brought along. Then, she opened it and took out her phone. The name, Monica, was displayed on the phone screen. She pressed the button. By then, Edward had walked out to the balcony. He was smoking outside, taking in drags of smoke, and she could not tell his emotions. I thought I wouldn't be able to get through, Monica said, her voice calm. Jean's throat moved slightly. Yes, I'm back in Southampton City. I know. I saw the news. 
news. Come to think of it, the Sanders had announced her identity to all the officials at the banquet, so it was understandable for her identity to be announced to the entire country. It was supposed to be Stacy's wedding, yet she had stolen all the limelight. If it were anyone else, they would probably go crazy. However, it was precisely because Stacy was part of the Sanders that she could not even express her emotions. So, your surname is Sanders, Monica said faintly. She did not seem to know how to express her emotions. When she saw the news, she actually thought that she had seen it wrongly. The news said, the Sanders lost princess, Jean Sanders, has finally returned home. At that time, she found the name Jean Sanders strange. Why did the princess have such a similar name to Jean? However, only when she opened it and saw Jean's photo did she truly believe that the so-called Jean Sanders was her best friend, Jean, who had grown up with her. It was the woman she had thought was extraordinary since she was young was really extraordinary. She did not know how to express her feelings. It was probably the first time she had felt emotional after such a long time. That was why she desperately wanted to give Jean a call. It had been a long time since she had been so eager to do something. In fact, she did not expect the call to go through. She just wanted to vent her emotions, but unexpectedly, Jean answered her call. After the call connected, the two of them did not speak much. In the past, she would babble non-stop, but now, she really did not know what to say. She could not figure out what their relationship was. Was she considered an enemy? After all, the Sanders had always wanted to bring down Cardellini Enterprise, and Jean had become their daughter. Monica, Jean suddenly said. Monica gripped her phone tightly. I've known about this for a long time. She was saying that she had known for a long time that she was the daughter of the Sanders. Why did you hide it from me? Monica asked her. In fact, what she was most concerned about was how Jean was doing or what Jean was going through right now. It really did not matter whether they were enemies or not. I didn't want to drag you into any trouble, Jean replied. Am I that untrustworthy of your trust? No, Jean said, but I hope that you can live a better life. Jean, am I really that weak to you? I'll feel bad if you get hurt. Me too. I'll also feel bad because you hid it from me. Monica was a little agitated and sounded a little riled up. But if you can live a good life, I'd rather you blame me. Jeannie. Monica. The only thing I can do is protect Cardellini Pharmaceutical. As for the rest, I can't make any promises, nor can I agree to let you get involved in my affairs. I don't want you to take on any innocent sacrifices. The only people important to me in this world are Kingsley, George, and you. You better live well. Monica's eyes were red. She could hear the determination in Jean's voice that Jean would not tell her anything. The two of them held their phones tightly and did not speak for a long time. Jeannie. Monica regained her calm and forced herself to calm down. Jean was a little surprised that Monica could control her emotions so well. As expected, Monica had grown up. In fact, it could be said that she had grown up in the cruelest conditions. Don't die, okay? Monica suddenly begged. When she was powerless and did not have the ability to help Jean, she only had one request, and that was for Jean to be alive. Jean did not give Monica an answer because there was none. No one could guarantee that they would not die in the next second. She looked at Edward, who had already returned to the room. She did not know what Edward had heard. What would happen to him if he heard was not among the most important people? Perhaps only then would they no longer be a burden to each other. After Edward returned, he did not say anything. 
The two of them waited in silence in the room until it was time for the dinner banquet. Edward and Jean were invited to a dinner banquet. It was still the same people in the same banquet hall. Jean was still sitting next to Warren, and Warren was still doting on her. At the banquet, it was a harmonious scene. By the way, Edward, you can communicate more with William in the future. You're both in business, so you might have the chance to work together in the future. Warren seemed to be helping both of them out, like an elder showing concern for his juniors. Yes, father. William hurriedly agreed and said courteously, actually, I've had some dealings with fourth master in private. I believe that now we're a family, we will cooperate even more in the future. That's good. Warren was very pleased. Let me give a toast to fourth master and Jeannie. I've always had some business with fourth master, but I didn't expect that we'd become a family one day, William said very happily. Edward and Jean raised their glasses as well. Edward said, we should be the ones toasting you. We wish you a happy marriage. Look at you too, you'll be a family from now on, Chester chimed in. Chester is right, and let's drink to that. Cheers. William drank first as a form of respect. Edward and Jean also did the same. Then, they put down their glasses. As William was sitting beside Edward, and because the atmosphere had eased up, the two of them even exchanged a few words in a low voice. It looked like they had a good relationship, but in reality, socializing was normal in the business world and would not attract anyone's attention. The dinner was a short one. When Warren noticed that Jean had not touched her food, he whispered in her ear, Are you done eating? Yes. Jean nodded. Only then did Warren put down his utensils, and as soon as he did that, the others naturally stopped eating. As he stood up, everyone at the table, and even everyone in the banquet hall, stood up. Warren was used to that kind of respect. He said, come on. I'll send you and Edward off. All right. Jean got up and followed behind Warren. Edward was naturally by Jean's side. Warren personally sent them to the main entrance of the Sanders residence. He took Jean's hand and said heavily, take good care of yourself and come home often. All right, Jean agreed. Warren looked at Edward again. I'll leave my precious daughter to you. Father, don't worry. Go on. Warren sounded a little helpless, and his expression looked a little sad. Perhaps he was really sad. After all, that glance might be the last he took of her. Warren turned around and left. As he left, he sighed and waved his hand. Edward and Jean remained respectful. After Warren was a distance away, Edward pulled Jean along and walked out of the Sanders residence, where a black car was parked. Knox had stood guard for a day in the car. When he saw Edward returning with Jean, Jean Sanders was back. Now, everyone in Harkin knew that Jean was Warren's daughter. Jean was the princess of the Sanders and had a distinguished status. Knox sneered. He knew that Jean was not a simple woman. When he first investigated Jean's background, he found it impossible for Jean's mother to have fallen in love with Alexander Lawrence and be with him. There must be something hidden behind it. However, he found nothing useful in his investigation. Now, he seemed to understand why there was nothing. The Sanders had probably hidden everything a long time ago because they were afraid that Jean's identity would be exposed. In all of Harkin, only the Sanders had the ability to destroy all the evidence to the point that he could not find anything. Knox, sit in the back, Edward suddenly ordered. Knox's eyes narrowed. At that moment, he saw Edward opening his car door. As soon as Knox got out of the car, Edward pushed Jean into the front passenger seat. 
Then, he closed the door and went to the driver's seat. He said to the driver, sit in the back. The driver quickly got out of the car and sat in the back seat with Knox. Once Edward got into the car, he stepped on the accelerator and sped off at a crazy speed. Knox could not help but grip the armrest tightly, and Jean did the same. The car sped up. As it was still not too late at night, there were still countless cars on the streets of Southampton City when Edward shuttled back and forth crazily, causing chaos after chaos. Edward. Knox seemed to have realized that something was wrong with Edward. In such crowded traffic, cars were coming in from all directions, and Edward's madness made it seem like he did not want to live. They had just passed the red light and were almost hit by the car coming from the side. Fortunately, Edward was quick to react, but the sharp turn and drift almost sent the person in the car flying. Knox grabbed Edward's arm. Calm down. However, Edward did not reply nor did he slow down. Edward. Knox squeezed Edward's arm to stop him from driving so recklessly, but Edward still did not react. His eyes were fixed on the road ahead, and he was still speeding without any signs of slowing down. Edward, calm down. I know what I'm doing, Edward said coldly. His cold voice pushed Knox away. Knox did not dare to stop him now. At their current speed, if Edward were not careful, they would be crushed into pieces. With that, he looked coldly at Jean, the woman who had provoked Edward. It seemed that she was the cause of all of Edward's emotions for a long time. Jean could also sense Knox's hostility, but she chose to ignore it. Moreover, with Edward's insane speed, it was very likely that everyone in the car would be killed. Hence, she had to be prepared to jump out of the car any time. Silence filled the car, and by then, they were already in the suburbs. The further they drove, the more remote the place was, and the more they did not know where they were. Every surrounding land seemed empty. When they reached the end of the road, he slammed on the brakes, and the car came to a violent stop. Everyone's seat belts tightened. Their body did hurt a little, but the car finally stopped. After the car stopped, Edward only stayed in the car for a second before he unbuckled his seatbelt and got out of the car. No one knew what Edward was up to. No one knew why he suddenly went crazy and drove the car here. They just looked at him as he opened Jean's car door, unbuckled her seatbelt, and let her out of the car. Their surroundings were pitch black, and all around them seemed to be fields. There was nothing strange about the place. However, it was obvious that Edward was waiting for someone. Jean was frightened. At that moment, she could not help but wonder what Edward was going to do to her. She tried to keep calm and said, Are you going to kill me? Edward did not reply. Instead, his grip on her hand tightened. Are you preparing to hand me over to the Duncans? Jean raised her eyebrows. To Edward, the best way was to hand her over. By handing her over to the Duncans, she would be able to prove her loyalty on one hand, and on the other, they could use her to threaten the Sanders. Even if it did not have much effect, it was the most beneficial to Edward. Edward still did not answer. All he did was hold her hand tightly in his palm and did not say a word. Jean was also holding back. In fact, she had already made all the necessary preparations when she came back. She could accept all the tragedies that could happen. After some time, a few cars quickly arrived and stopped a few meters away from them. A group of people then got out of the car. It was not the so-called Duncans. It was Kingsley, who had appeared with Lucy and all the top assassins of the hills. It turned out that Edward was waiting for Kingsley and not for the Duncans. She turned around to look at Edward in disbelief. Did he know what he was doing? 
Did he know what he would face if he called Kingsley over? She knew that Edward only had Knox with him. Even if he had a driver, it would not be of any use. Now, he was facing all the top assassins of the hills alone. Even a country would find it difficult to eliminate all of them, who were a group of capable fugitives. He should probably be able to figure out that after he had successfully tricked Kingsley and escaped last time, Kingsley would definitely not let him get what he wanted this time. This time, Kingsley would definitely not be deceived by his treachery and would even kill him. He should be able to predict what would happen to him. Yet, he still called Kingsley over. They looked at each other under the car's headlights. Kingsley said coldly, Fourth Master Swan, you're really not afraid of death. He had realized at the first moment that there was no one protecting Edward and that Edward had come to see him alone. The fact that I could inform you to come here means that I'm prepared to die. Edward enunciated every word. That sentence made Jean's heart ache a little, and she bit her lips so hard that it lost all color. What do you want? Kingsley asked. For Edward to offer himself up, it was definitely not because he wanted to die. He naturally had his own motives. Edward said, send Jean away, and don't ever let her return to Harkin. Kingsley frowned. I know you have the ability to get Jean to leave safely. Edward said bluntly. This is your condition for the exchange. Kingsley asked, your death in exchange for Jean's safety. Yes. Edward agreed. Kingsley just looked at Edward coldly, as if sizing him up. If I'm dead, you'll have one less threat. If I'm dead, Jean wouldn't be a bargaining chip for the Sanders, and the Sanders won't keep chasing after her. Edward had thought everything through. The Sanders had made use of Jean because of their relationship. Once he died, Jean would be useless to the Duncans. Then, Jean, that so-called trump card, would be useless. Kingsley looked at Edward and then at Jean, whose face was pale. He said, all right. Kingsley immediately agreed. He had never agreed for Jean to be the bait, but he could not find a better way to reject them. After all, he and the Sanders were in a mutually beneficial relationship. However, the Sanders ruled over a country, while he was only a local assassin organization. His power and status were incomparable to them. Once the two sides fell out and he lost the support of the Sanders, the other organizations and even some small countries that had been tempted to attack would attack the hills without any restraint. Then, the hills would face a great crisis. Of course, there was another important point. The reason why the Sanders could take over the Harkin was because of the hills' contribution. Once the country was taken back by the original ruler, the hills would naturally become the target of revenge. In order for the hills to protect themselves and become even more glorious, Kingsley had to be controlled by Warren. The only way was to follow the rules of the Sanders and let Jean be the one to start the war. However, the best way for Jean to escape and scathe would be Edward's death. Kingsley did not expect Edward to be able to figure out everything so quickly. He even made that decision so quickly. His eyes were fixed on Edward, and he watched as Edward subconsciously tightened his grip on Jean's hand. Edward should know very well that once he let go, he would be dead. He turned to look at Jean, who was also looking at him. Meeting each other again this time was not a reunion but a separation. He said, Jeannie. His voice was still deep and magnetic. Jean's heart ached. In fact, it had been hurting bit by bit. She had been feeling that way ever since she appeared at the Sanders wedding. The thought of the damage her identity would bring to Edward. She had actually been suppressing the thought of the damage her identity would bring to Edward all along and struggling with it. That was why she remained silent, to try to hide all his emotions. 
She did not want Edward to know or want Edward to be soft-hearted toward her. However, in the end, he still had to sacrifice himself for her. I've told Finn to pick up George, and Finn will protect George with his life. As long as you leave Harkin and contact Finn after things have stabilized, he will send George to you safely, Edward explained. It was as if he was saying his last words. Jean's eyes turned red. Slowly, her eyes filled with tears. Promise me that you will never return to Harkin. No matter whose regime it becomes, never come back. Edward said. As he said that, his eyes seemed to turn red. Jean had never seen Edward cry before, and that was probably the only time in her life that she would be able to see it. However, it was at the moment of life and death. Promise me. Edward forced Jean to answer. Jean bit her lips and refused not let go. She looked at Edward with her eyes red. However, he would still be in Harkin. How could she not come back for the rest of her life? How could she leave his corpse on this land while she went away? Please, promise me. Edward's voice was hoarse, and it also trembled. Tears streamed down Jean's face. She knew that Edward did not want her to return because Harkin was no longer safe for her, because he did not want her to avenge him, and because he wanted her to forget him completely. She had never been willing to admit her feelings for Edward, and she did not know when she had developed feelings for him. However, at that moment, she really could not ignore the pain in her heart. It was as if her heart was being torn apart, piece by piece. All right. Jean nodded. The moment she agreed, she even felt that the sky was falling down. However, Edward smiled. His red eyes and perfect lips curved into a smile that could cause the downfall of a city. He said nothing more of their relationship, the sadness, the reluctance to part, and everything else. He did not say anything. Instead, little by little, he let go of her reddened hand and let her go to Kingsley's side. Still, Jean did not leave. Her vision was so blurry that she could no longer see Edward's face clearly. She did not know if Edward was the same as her and could not see her clearly. Even so, she just kept staring at him. Jean! Come here! Kingsley shouted. Jean's throat moved slightly. Then, she turned around and walked away from Edward. She knew very well what it would mean if she turned around. Jean returned to Kingsley's side with her vision blurry. Kingsley just looked at her coldly and said, Jean, I told you to be prepared. She knew, but... Jean was trying so hard to hold it in that she bit her lips until they bled. Nevertheless, Kingsley was unmoved as he left Jean's side and walked toward Edward. Knox was standing behind Edward and was well aware that they would definitely die in that situation. However, Knox still stood in front of Edward. He was not very capable of much, but the only thing he could do was take a bullet for Edward. The only thing he had was to die before Edward. Knox. Edward's tone was heavy. Don't try to persuade me. I order you to leave. Edward enunciated every word. I won't listen to orders. Knox was very determined. I won't let you die in front of me. There's no way. His eyes were bloodshot as he faced the black gun in front of him. Kingsley's gun was already pointed at Knox's forehead. However, Knox did not move. Knox. Edward called out to him. I don't have any pursuits in my life, nor do I have anything I like. Playing with women is just a pastime. The only thing I've decided to do in this life is to be able to help you. No need. Edward said bluntly, I chose this path myself. I don't need you to be buried with me. Since you've chosen it, it's the right choice. 
Knox. Edward's expression sank. Since it's the right choice, I'll die, with no regrets. Before Knox could finish his sentence, his vision turned black. He was knocked unconscious by someone behind him and fell to the ground unwillingly. Just like that, he passed out. Edward had schemed against him. Of course, Knox could die for him, but it could not be because he wanted Knox to die with him when he chose to die. The only reason why Knox would die for him would be because he could still live. He had more important things to do, so he could not die. Knox sacrificing himself like that was not worth it. Kingsley watched Edward's every move. Edward said, without me, Knox won't be of much use. It was not that Knox could not do it. Rather, Knox would only listen to his arrangements, and once he had no orders, Knox would not do anything. Kingsley did not make any promises to Edward. Killing Knox was something he could do with a single thought. He could let Knox die with Edward, but he could also let Knox live. It all depended on his mood. He aimed at Edward's forehead. Once the bullet was fired, Edward would die instantly. Jean, Lucy called out to Jean. She watched as Jean stared at the scene in front of her, where Kingsley was about to kill Edward. In the end, she could not bear to let Jean see everything. Don't look, she said. Don't look at such a cruel scene. However, Jean bit her lip and shook her head in refusal. She did not hate Kingsley, but she wanted to send Edward off on his last journey. Even if it was too horrible to look at, she still wanted to look. As she straightened her back, she felt Edward's gaze on her. The moment Kingsley's gun touched Edward's forehead, his eyes were fixed on her. The two of them stared into each other's eyes. Edward opened his mouth and did not make a sound. However, he was saying, goodbye. They would never see each other again. In the quiet night in the vast wilderness, a deafening gunshot suddenly sounded. The loud noise did not come from Kingsley, but from behind him. Suddenly, after a gunshot, a barrage of gunshots followed one after another. At that moment, everyone hid behind the car. The next moment, a few cars drove over, and they threw a grenade at them. Edward dragged Knox's body and jumped to a slope at the edge of the field to hide. Meanwhile, Kingsley and the others also quickly retreated and dispersed. The two cars were set on fire. War seemed to have broken out at that moment. Edward patted Knox's face. Knox opened her eyes and felt a sharp pain at the back of her head. Wake up, Edward said to him. Knox's eyes widened as he looked at Edward. Why was he not dead? Edward hurriedly explained, I don't know whose men they are. What do you mean? Knox was baffled. What had happened in the second that Edward knocked him out? I don't know if it's the Sanders or the Duncan's men who rushed over. Now, we and Kingsley's men are surrounded. Where's Jean? At the thought of that woman, Knox was filled with anger. She's with Kingsley. F asterisk CK don't let me see her again, Knox said viciously. The most important thing now is to find out who's behind this. There was a look of urgency on Edward's face. As they could not determine who it was, they could not guarantee Jean's safety. It would be fine if they were from the Sanders. If it was the Duncans. They're from the Duncans, Knox confirmed. Edward frowned. This. Knox took out a small tracking device. Edward's expression changed. The Duncans gave it to me and told me to keep it with me without you knowing. Edward, don't blame me. I didn't want you to die. Knox did not hide it. There was no need to hide anything between brothers. Even if Knox had disobeyed his orders, Edward did not say anything at that moment. He did not complain or get angry. 
He understood where Knox was coming from and did not blame Knox, but he wanted to send Jean away. He had to send her away because if he did not, Jean would die without a doubt. He suddenly left from the bottom of the slope. There were still countless gunshots out there, and it was obvious that Kingsley had started fighting with the Duncans. Edward. Knox wanted to stop him but could not. By then, Edward had already rushed out toward Kingsley. Knox gritted his teeth and had no choice but to go over. He wondered if the Duncans would notice their actions in the dark. If they were discovered, they would not be able to clear their names. Edward quickly appeared in Kingsley's hiding place. Kingsley looked at Edward coldly and pointed the gun at Edward. I can't die now. Edward said, we have to send Jean away first. If he was dead now, Jean would definitely die too. Hence, before Jean was safe, he could not die. Kingsley endured it. You ambushed me, he said ruthlessly. If I were the one who ambushed you, I wouldn't have appeared in front of you again. I want to talk to you about cooperation now. For Jean's life, we have to work together. Edward's words were quick and urgent. According to the current situation, the Duncans have a lot of manpower. Even if you break out of the encirclement, you will still suffer heavy losses in the end. More importantly, can you guarantee that you can still leave Harkin safely with Jean? Would Warren allow you to leave with Jean? What do you want me to do? Kingsley agreed. When it came to Jean's safety, the two men in front of her had always reached an agreement. You'll be the bait to let the Duncans and even the Sanders think that the Duncans and I are after you. Take this opportunity to get someone to secretly leave with Jean. When everyone's attention is on you, let Jean go first. All right, Kingsley said without hesitation. I'm returning to the Duncan's side now. In 10 minutes at most, you have to let me see your figure. Then, I'll lead everyone to hunt you down. With that, Edward left. It had never crossed his mind that Kingsley would refuse because it was obvious that Kingsley could not refuse. The best way now was to take the advantage of the chaos to send Jean away. Edward, that man, could react faster than anyone else. It would really be a pity for him to die. Kingsley watched as Edward left with Knox. At that moment, he turned around and went to Jean's hiding place. K-01, Kingsley ordered. Mr. Thorne, K-01 said respectfully. In 10 minutes, I'll leave with everyone in that direction. I've talked to 4th Master Swan. He'll bring all his men to chase after me, and you'll take this opportunity to leave with Jean from this direction. Just the two of you will go because the chances of you both getting exposed will lessen with fewer people. After you leave, think of a way to return to the Delta Islands and wait for me to return. Yes. What if you don't come back? Jean suddenly asked Kingsley. Tonight was clearly different from any other time as tonight's battle was much more intense than any other time. Since the other party was from the Duncans, the Duncans had already started their move. They had been hiding for decades and finally showing themselves, so it would definitely not be a small move. He could lure everyone away, but could he guarantee that he would be able to escape unscathed? If I don't come back, take all the money to a country you want to go to and never come back. Don't go back to the Delta Islands or Southampton City. Go as far as you can. Kingsley, I don't want to. Jean refused and kept shaking her head. She did not want anyone to die for her. Your survival is more important than anyone else's. I'm not important, I'm not important at all. Jean was on the verge of breaking down. From the moment Edward said that he would die for her, she had been holding back until she was about to break down. I'm not that important for all of you to protect me with your lives. What's so important about me that you're willing to go to this extent for me, 
cause a country's war, and be stained with the blood of so many people? I'm just a nobody. I'm not worth it. You're worth it. Kingsley enunciated each word. Kingsley, do you think I'll be happy if you do this? Do you think that if you, Edward, and everyone else were dead, I would still be alive? Do you really think I can be so heartless? Do you really think I will? You will because George is still waiting for you, Kingsley interrupted her. Jean's heart ached. There was still George. For a long time, she did not dare to think about George because she did not know if she could always be by his side. Hence, she did not allow herself to think about him so much. For George's sake, stay alive, Kingsley said, deeply. Jean's entire body tensed up. It was so depressing that it was unbearable. For George. She could not just do nothing. Kingsley added, the Hills, Sanders, Duncans, and Swans should have settled this long ago. This is something that cannot be avoided, and what would it become in the end? Promise me that it's all history. Don't take revenge or hold a grudge. This is a process of natural selection. If I die, it's because I'm not strong enough. If the Sanders, Duncans, and Swans are defeated, that will be their end. No one should bear the consequences of this ending. It'll be over. An end was an end. Whoever was not capable enough deserved to die, and he could not blame anyone for that, so there was no need to take revenge. K01 Kingsley ordered, protect Jean. Yes. K01 was determined. Kingsley was about to leave with everyone when Jean suddenly called out to him, uncle. It was rare to hear her call him that. Kingsley pursed his lips. At that moment, his expression finally changed to one that no assassin had ever seen on Kingsley's face. I'll wait for you to come home, Jean said. I'll wait for you to come home. In the future, whatever you say, I won't resist you anymore. I won't make you angry anymore. In the future, we'll be a family and live happily together. Yes, Kingsley responded. Then, he took everyone with him and left their hiding place. Lucy left with Kingsley too. Since Kingsley had only ordered K-01 to protect Jean, the others naturally did not dare to follow her. Before Lucy left, she gestured to Jean and said, don't worry. She wanted to reassure Jean, but little did she know that that was the last thing she would say to Jean. Jean's eyes turned red as she watched them leave in front of her, exposed to the rain of bullets. As they left, another group quickly chased after them. The war was getting more and more intense. Jean, K-01 reminded her. He was telling her that she could leave now. Jean gritted her teeth. Since everyone wanted her to live, she had to stay alive. With that, she followed K-01 and left in another direction, away from the battlefield. Under the night sky, gunshots rang out everywhere. Every sound seemed to make the world tremble. The shooting went on for the entire night. There were countless casualties, and corpses and blood were everywhere. As the sky gradually brightened, the sound of gunfire also gradually decreased. Edward and Knox led a group of people and hid in a deep trench. In front of them was a dead end. Kingsley had been forced into a corner. Of course, since they did not know how many men Kingsley had left, they did not dare to attack him so easily. Fourth Master Jack Lynch, the leader of the Duncans in charge of this operation, called out to him respectfully. Yes. Do you need any reinforcements? Jack asked. They knew that in their current situation, they might not be able to take down Kingsley. After all, Kingsley's men were all top-notch assassins. Although there were not many of them, 
they had not gained any advantage after a night. However, what surprised Edward was that. Logically speaking, Kingsley should have brought a lot of men to Harkin, even though bringing all of them was inconvenient to travel. However, it had been a night. Why had no assassins come over to support them? Once they came, the people led by Edward would not be able to withstand a single blow. Then, Kingsley could leave without a hitch and would not have been forced into such a state. We need reinforcements. The sooner, the better, Edward instructed. Yes. Jack was extremely respectful. He made a phone call and reported the current situation. After a while, he returned to Edward's side. They've agreed to send more people here. They will arrive in about half an hour. Tell them to be careful not to be discovered by the Sanders. Once the Sanders comes to support, we will not gain anything. Yes. The other party respectfully dialed a number to remind the people who were coming. Edward said, I'll bring Knox and a few of the men over to scout the situation. You guys cover us. After we enter, we won't act rashly. Once the reinforcements arrive, send us a signal. Knox and I will give you instructions according to the situation. Won't it be too dangerous? Jack was worried. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Pay attention to the surroundings and keep an eye out for the Sanders or the other assassins of the hills, Edward instructed. Yes. Edward randomly picked two people and brought Knox along as they sneaked in from the side. With that, a gunshot was purposely sounded from the other side. It was obvious that it was to distract the attention of the people inside so that Edward and Knox could enter smoothly. The four of them carefully crept forward and approached the bamboo forest where Kingsley was hiding. Halfway there, they hid in a deep ravine. Edward gave Knox a look, and after so many years of tacit understanding, Knox understood at a glance. The two of them were quick to react. In an instant, the two people who followed them were knocked to the ground. Take off their clothes, Edward instructed, already putting his plan into action. Knox really held it in again and again. He felt that Edward was courting death. However, he had no choice but to follow the arrangement and take off the clothes of the two men. After that, Edward did not stop and left immediately. Edward. Knox pulled him back. Don't worry. Edward pushed Knox away and rushed in. Still, Knox suppressed his anger and followed Edward in without a care for his life. Anyway, if Edward wanted to die, they would die together. The two of them arrived at the bamboo forest that Kingsley was hidden in. There was a clearing ahead of the bamboo forest, and once exposed, they would be shot to death. They could only hide inside, behind the bamboo. Since the other party did not know what was going on inside, they did not dare to rush in. At that moment, when Kingsley saw Edward, his raised gun paused. However, he did not hide the fact that his expression was extremely ugly after being forced to this point. Edward, on the other hand, noticed that there were only three people left with Kingsley. If the Duncans increased their manpower, Kingsley would not be able to escape. He asked, are your assassins under Warren's control? The fact that no backup came was obvious. Kingsley's expression was grim. It seemed that his guess was correct. The Sanders was really despicable. Warren had predicted that Edward would make a move and that Kingsley would not sit by and do nothing. Thus, he wanted them to kill each other. Once Kingsley died, all the assassins of the hills would be his, and they would not need to go through Kingsley's command. After all, he was only making use of Jean, but Kingsley would truly give his all to Jean. Once he threatened Jean's life, Kingsley may turn against him at any time. He was also worried that Kingsley would be captured by the swans. 
Once that happened, not only would he suffer heavy losses, but the other party would be even stronger. How could he let such a thing happen? He wanted to use Edward to help him get rid of Kingsley or use Kingsley to kill Edward. Whoever died here would be of great benefit to him. If Kingsley died, the assassins of the hills would be his, and he could make those people kill the Duncans and the Swans for him. With all the resources he had, he refused to believe that he could not kill those minions. It would be better if Edward was dead. Then, the most capable general of the Duncans would be eliminated. Without him, the Duncans' survival rate would be damaged by at least half. As for Jean, if she was still alive, Jean's hatred for Edward or Kingsley would double. He could make better use of Jean. If Jean were to die. In any case, she was just bait, and her death was not worth pitying. I'll send you off, Edward said bluntly. Kingsley looked at him coldly. The Duncans are increasing their manpower and will arrive in half an hour. Once they arrive, they will attack, and you won't be able to leave. Edward said bluntly, these are two sets of clothes for the Duncans' men. Who do you want to change into these? Since there were three other people besides Kingsley, he was not sure who Kingsley would want to change into it. Kingsley took the clothes from Edward's hands. Kirby, change into it. He called out Kirby's name. Lucy was right beside Kirby. Kirby did not expect Kingsley to give him the clothes. Everyone knew that the set of clothes was their only hope for survival, and everyone wanted it. However, he said, I don't need it. Give it to Miss Harmon. She's a woman, so she'll be easily discovered with her figure, Kingsley said coldly. That was true. She was a woman, so she would be easily discovered. In that case, it was only natural that Kingsley would not give it to her. Kirby. Kingsley's face darkened. If you don't want it, I'll give it to you. Change into it. Lucy interrupted Kingsley and looked at Kirby sternly. Kirby looked at Lucy. He had never thought that he would be able to leave that place alive. In fact, he was prepared to die. Hurry up, Lucy urged. Kirby held it in. After all, assassins did not have much emotion. Kirby quickly took off his clothes and changed into the ones he was given. I suggest that he puts on your clothes. Edward pointed to another male assassin and said, he needs to disguise himself as you to attract the attention of the people outside. Then, I will bring you guys out of here. Once you are out of their sight, you should leave immediately. I will try my best to buy you time. Kingsley nodded. In all aspects, Edward was very thoughtful to immediately order the assassin to change into Kingsley's clothes. An assassin would listen to orders at any time, even if it meant death. Therefore, the assassin quickly put on Kingsley's clothes to die for him. In a while, you'll go this way and try to attract their attention. Edward was giving instructions on how to prolong the life of that assassin. The longer it took, the more time Kingsley would have to escape. An assassin always followed the instruction given to him and never had a choice. Lucy did not either. She said, I'll go with him. Together, they would be bait. Edward paused and looked at Kingsley. At that moment, Kingsley's hand that was holding the gun trembled. It's impossible for Kingsley to not have me by his side. They'll only believe that this person is Kingsley if I show up. Then, they'll really come after us. Lucy said rationally. Edward did not reply because he agreed with Lucy's suggestion. Without a doubt, that was the best way. Lucy had always been by Kingsley's side. Once Lucy and the assassin in Kingsley's disguise appeared, the other party would not hesitate to believe that the person in disguise was Kingsley. Then, they would chase after him regardless of the consequences. 
Once they were lured away, it would be much easier for Kingsley to escape. It had to be said that that was for the best. However, he wanted to see if Kingsley was willing to let the woman who had been with him for so many years die for him. There were two seconds of silence. Due to the time constraint, they could only be silent for a moment. Kingsley then said, we'll do as Lucy said. As she suggested, she would go with the other assassin as bait. Lucy nodded. In the face of life and death, she could only face it with the calmest attitude. Once, everything was agreed upon, Edward reminded, hurry up. He was reminding Kingsley to give the order. Kingsley finally glanced at Lucy and watched as she whispered something to Kirby. Kirby kept nodding his head and could not hide his emotions. After giving a few simple instructions, Lucy left Kirby's side. The moment she left, Kirby pulled her back, obviously because he could not bear it. Miss Harmon. Kingsley saw all of that. He looked at the two of them, who looked like they were saying goodbye to each other. However, there was no farewell between the assassins. His eyes were cold. Get ready. His voice was cold and emotionless. Lucy pushed Kirby's hand away and walked to the side of the male assassin. After confirming that they were ready, Edward said into the phone, We seem to have been discovered. Be careful. Roger that. Edward put down the phone and looked at Kingsley. Kingsley made a hand gesture. Lucy and the male assassin received the order and rushed out together. From the beginning to the end, she did not look at Kingsley, like she was not reluctant to part with him, and neither did she expect anything. When Lucy and the assassin left, Kingsley's hand seemed to stretch out for a moment. However, he then clenched his fist to stop himself. He could only watch helplessly as Lucy left with the assassin. The two of them hid while leaving, but they were still discovered. The next second, the sound of gunfire rang out around them, firing wildly at the two of them. At the same time, the Duncan's men, who were hiding there, quickly chased after them. The two of them kept running forward, and the people behind him were getting closer and closer. Lucy had been covering for the assassin behind her, trying to let him leave successfully. Ultimately, there was a great disparity in manpower. After running for a while, Lucy and the male assassin soon felt that they were powerless. Miss Harmon. The male assassin said, you can go first. I'll cover for you. You don't have to. I'm going to die anyway, the male assassin said bluntly. Even so, I still have to die later. Lucy's tone was firm. That way, Kingsley will have more time to evacuate. Mr. Thorne just left you behind. The male assassin did not want to sow discord, but in the face of death, he had nothing to fear. Yes, Lucy replied. Why are you still working for him? The male assassin was puzzled. Why are you still working for him? Lucy asked. I don't have a choice. If I don't listen to his arrangements, I will die. In fact, I will die in a more tragic way than I am going to now. Aren't I the same? Lucy and the assassin were running frantically. But now, I've decided to give up. The assassin suddenly stopped. Behind them were the people who were chasing them, and he suddenly stopped. If he stopped, he would definitely die. Lucy did not even think about it. She immediately grabbed the assassin and continued running. I've reached my limit. The male assassin was obviously starting to slack off. I'm going to die anyway, so why force myself like this? Miss Harmon, I'm not leaving. Just hold on a little longer. Lucy encouraged. I don't think there's any meaning to life anymore. The male assassin said, I'll end up dead anyway. But it's different for Kingsley. 
Kingsley has given up on us. The assassin reminded her again. Isn't that why we exist? I'm not that great. Annoyed, the assassin broke free from Lucy's shackles. Lucy was caught off guard and pushed away by the assassin. She even took a few steps back. Miss Harmon, if you want to leave, I can cover for you. If you don't, we'll wait for death together. I told you. Ah. Oh. Lucy suddenly let out a low cry. Just as she was distracted, a bullet hit her thigh. Her legs trembled unconsciously, but she endured the pain and wanted to continue running with the assassin. However, the assassin refused her approach. He said, I won't sell my life to Kingsley anymore. I won't. At that moment, he even raised his pistol and aimed it at his head. They were going to die anyway, and either way. Don't. Lucy rushed forward and covered the man's muzzle with her hand. The bullet fired and pierced through Lucy's palm. At that moment, Lucy could even think of using her other hand to press down on the assassin's head to prevent the bullet from penetrating her palm and hitting the assassin's head. The assassin was still shocked by Lucy's determination. Just as he wanted to say something, the people chasing after them caught up. The moment the fastest person saw their figures, he aimed the gun at the assassin's head. However, in everyone's eyes, that person was Kingsley, and the first person they wanted to kill was Kingsley. When the bullet fired, Lucy suddenly stood in front of the man, and the bullet pierced through Lucy's head. Bang! It was so loud that sounded like it had shattered the sky. Just like that, Lucy could taste death. With all her strength, Lucy said word by word, please, leave. He should run to keep himself alive for a while longer, and it would give Kingsley a little more chance to escape. The assassin was moved by Lucy's actions. As an assassin, he should not have any emotions except for carrying out orders. In the face of life and death, the fact that Lucy was willing to do so much for Kingsley. Who could say that it was not because she loved him too deeply? The assassin left quickly after Lucy pushed him away. At that moment, he was escaping only for Lucy because he did not want to disappoint her in the end. When he left, Lucy slumped to the ground, with her face, body, and internal organs bleeding. Her consciousness was slipping, as well as everything else. She looked straight up at the white clouds in front of her and watched as they become more blurry. Suddenly, an image appeared in her mind. It was a scene that still stayed in her mind after so many years. She saw Kingsley the first time she met him. She was on a mission, which was to assassinate him, and the best way to assassinate Kingsley was to seduce him. That was the first time she used a skill she had never used before on Kingsley. At that time, she and Kingsley had done it. When she thought that Kingsley was not paying attention, she hid a very, very thin wire in her mouth in an attempt to strangle him. However, Kingsley saw through it with one glance. In an instant, she was shackled by Kingsley. That was the first time she failed a mission since she became an assassin. She had originally thought that after that time, she would take a sum of money and leave the business to wander the world. In the end, she failed, and failure meant she would die. She had already made all the necessary preparations, but at that moment, she heard Kingsley say, I like you. Lucy looked at him in disbelief. You're pretty good in bed, Kingsley said. Lucy pursed her lips. She did not think that was a reason for him to keep her. Follow me from now on. Kingsley did not give her any reason to refuse. Besides, she could not refuse because rejection meant death. However, betrayal would also lead to death. Don't worry. You and I will destroy your organization. Kingsley was a man of his word. 
It only took them a week to kill every single member of the organization that had once controlled her. From then on, she would not allow anyone to threaten her life because of her betrayal. From then on, she knew that she owed Kingsley her life because he saved her. Later on, she found out that Kingsley had only kept her because the most important person in his life, Jean, had appeared. He needed a top-notch female assassin to train Jean, and it was obvious that she was the only one at that time. Nevertheless, she still decided to be loyal to him. She was even glad that he had brought her back to the hills. It finally made her understand what it meant to be valued, and it allowed her to find back the feeling she had lost. Yet now, she suddenly regretted it. It was not that she regretted dying, but what she regretted was that she should not have agreed to Kingsley. If she had not agreed, Kingsley would not have shown any mercy, and she might not have had to go through so much. Perhaps she would not have to experience so many things that she felt were crueler than death. If there was a next life, she hoped that she would not go on that mission. Even if she went on that mission, she hoped that Kingsley would not let her live. Her heart had been hurt too badly, and she did not want to experience it again. Then, her vision went dark. Goodbye, Kingsley. They would never see each other again. As the sound of gunfire continued to ring out, the group quickly left in the opposite direction of the gunshots. Amidst the footsteps, Kirby suddenly fell down. Everyone turned around to look at him. There was no time to waste. Once the other party realized that it was not Kingsley, they would immediately give chase, and it would be even more difficult for them to escape. However, at that moment, Kingsley did not blame Kirby. All he saw was Kirby's red eyes filled with tears. That was an emotion that an assassin should not have. However, because of Lucy's death, she still cried. Although they had gone their separate ways in two different directions, the assassins had walkie-talkies with them. The distance between the two parties was not far enough for the walkie-talkies to lose signal, so they could hear the conversation between Lucy and the assassin clearly. They could even hear the gunshots clearly. That sentence of her pleading for him to leave was said with her last bit of strength, and it should be a farewell. Lucy was dead, and she had died for Kingsley. Before she died, she was still trying to buy more time for Kingsley to live. That woman who had always been silent and extremely tenacious. Kirby. Kingsley pulled him up. Kirby did not fall on purpose and did not want to waste time. However, at that moment, he was really upset. In the face of such a dangerous situation, he did not even have the right to feel upset. He saw Kingsley, who did not have that right either. Kingsley had also heard Lucy's entire conversation, but he did not respond. There was not a single trace of emotion on his face. Kirby did feel sorry for Lucy. She should have been like the assassin who left with Lucy. It was necessary to follow orders, but there was no need to risk her life for the man who had abandoned her. It was really not worth it. Kirby controlled his emotions and continued to leave with Kingsley. After walking for a distance, Edward stopped in his tracks. Knox naturally followed Edward. Edward said, Kingsley, I'll stop here. Next. Kingsley nodded. Before Edward could say anything, he already knew what Edward was going to say. The reason why Edward stopped talking was that he saw a tear fall from Kingsley's eye. Seeing Kingsley cry was rare. Hence, Edward suddenly stopped talking. At that moment, Kingsley knew what Edward was talking about. Edward nodded. Some men had feelings that they were unwilling to express, and some had feelings that they did not want others to know about so they would understand it and pretend not to know. That was probably a tacit understanding between men. Edward took Knox and turned to leave. He did not have much time to waste. 
With Lucy dead, the male assassin would not be able to hold on for much longer. Once his identity was discovered, he would immediately turn back to chase after Kingsley. If he returned now, he could still buy some time for Kingsley. However, at that very moment, a lot of people suddenly appeared in the direction Kingsley was leaving. At the same time, the sound of a helicopter came from the sky. It was obvious that it was the support troops from the Duncans. It all happened so fast that it was somewhat unexpected. Edward looked at Knox. Knox said, I swear that this has nothing to do with me. Last night, he had chosen to cooperate with the Duncans and plot against his own brother because he was really afraid that Edward would be killed by Jean. However, now that he had chosen to stand on his brother's side and Edward was not in danger, he had no need to do so. Edward knew very well that Knox would not do that. It was just instinctual for him to look at Knox to calm himself down and think about what to do next. The current situation was that if he let Kingsley go and the Duncans discovered he did that, he would never be able to gain the Duncans' trust again. It was very likely that he would harm his entire family, including the Winters. However, if he did not let Kingsley go, Edward's mind was spinning. He made a prompt decision. You're holding Knox and me hostage. Kingsley's eyes flickered. Sometimes, he really admired the man in front of him to be able to think of the best way to solve the situation when everyone was panicking. Edward did not give Kingsley any time to think. He turned around to let Kingsley restrain him and point the gun at his head. At the same time, Kirby had also shackled Knox. In the barren fields, Kingsley had Edward and Knox restrained while waiting for the arrival of the Duncans. Now, the sky was already bright, and everything could be seen clearly. The people who were rushing over from the distance surrounded them in an instant. All of them had their pistols raised and aimed at their enemy. If they were not careful, they would be shot to death. Of course, no one dared to act rashly because Edward and Knox were being held hostage. As such, they could only wait for orders. It was a stalemate for a while until the helicopter in the distance slowly approached and landed on the open field. However, no one came down from the helicopter. Just then, the group of people who had gone after Lucy and the male assassin came back in a hurry. They had probably realized that they had been tricked. Seeing the scene in front of him, Jack was shocked. He shouted to Edward, fourth master. Edward was very calm as he said, we have been tricked. Yes, Jack hurriedly nodded and said, we saw Kingsley and Lucy escape so we chased after them with all our might. We didn't expect it to be a diversion. In fact, I did suspect that something was up because I couldn't see Kingsley's appearance clearly. All I saw was that he was wearing the same clothes as Kingsley. But because I saw Lucy, I was certain that the person was Kingsley. Besides, if it weren't for Kingsley, Lucy wouldn't have risked her life to protect him. She wouldn't have risked her life to protect him until we shot her dead. That was why we were deceived, causing us to do useless work and even dragging you into this. He seemed to be trying his best to explain what he had just done because he was afraid of being punished by the Duncans. Besides Alex, the person with the highest status in the Duncans was 4th Master Swan. Therefore, he needed to explain the entire situation to Fourth Master Swan in hopes of receiving the minimum punishment. Yes. Edward replied, I also saw the Kingsley and Lucy in disguise leave, so I chased after them. I forgot that Kingsley was still hiding in the surroundings. So, when Knox and I wanted to catch up with our men, we were ambushed by Kingsley's men. The others were dealt with by Kingsley while Knox and I were held hostage. We couldn't send you a signal. Edward also explained his current situation. Of course, he was not explaining it to Jack but to the person in the helicopter. Who was in the helicopter? 
Edward was not sure, but he knew that he needed to put on a show with Kingsley. The situation remained in a stalemate. Before they received the order, no one dared to act rashly. With that, a long time passed. Every minute and second seemed to pass like a year. In fact, Edward was not confident that the Duncans would let Kingsley go for his sake. After all, it was not easy for them to catch Kingsley. Kingsley was the Sanders' biggest helper, and the Hills was one of the main culprits behind the downfall of the Duncans' political power. No matter what, at that point, they could not let Kingsley go so easily. Now that the Duncans had already reached the point of a direct conflict with the Sanders, they were prepared for war to break out at any moment. Once the war broke out, the key to victory was to get rid of all the opponents as quickly as possible. As such, the Duncans could not bear to let Kingsley go just like that, and that was why the stalemate lasted for so long. After all, killing Kingsley was important, but the death of Edward would also be a huge loss to the Duncans. Therefore, they had to weigh whether it was worth it to use Edward to exchange for Kingsley. At the scene, everyone was in a deadlock until two people suddenly alighted from the helicopter. Everyone turned to look. Even Kingsley looked over. He was wondering whether he would be able to find out who the descendant of the Duncans was before he died. Just who was it that would make the swans hide him so well that the Sanders could not find him even if they dug deeper? However, Kingsley was disappointed. That was because the person who got off the helicopter was not the descendant of the Duncans. It was Zachary, who rarely appeared in public in Southampton City, and Wade, who was always by Zachary's side. The two of them walked to Edward and Knox. They were protected by men as they faced Kingsley. Edward's eyes moved slightly. At that moment, Knox also reacted. He, too, did not expect that it would be old Master Swan and his grandfather. Their appearance might not be a good thing. Edward and Knox tried their best to remain calm. Mr. Thorne, Zachary said. He did not even look at his son before he started talking to Kingsley. Kingsley was also calm and composed. He said, Old Master Swan, I've heard so much about you. Zachary seemed to be smiling. He said, I've heard of your existence all these years, but I've never met you once. I've met your father a few times, though. But I heard that he passed away many years ago. Yes. Kingsley was still respectful towards Zachary. No matter what position they were in, some people's status would make others subconsciously admire them. Your father was a hero in battle and had contributed a lot to the Sanders, Zachary said bluntly and emotionally as if he was stating a fact. Back then, you also made a great contribution to the Sanders' political power, Old Master Swan. Kingsley also reminded him. That is true. I was the one who personally brought the head of the Duncans to the Sanders. Zachary did not refute. I wonder why you have changed his side all these years, old Master Swan. Kingsley's words were a little sarcastic. To have betrayed your own leader so frequently, I wonder if old Master Swan feels guilty about it. Mr. Thorne, you should know who I've been loyal to from the start. Zachary's face darkened. Kingsley continued to look at him fearlessly. The reason why I took down the head of the Duncans was to gain the trust of the Sanders. It was because the situation could no longer be reversed, and there was no way to stop the Sanders from taking power. In order to advance, I could only retreat and personally end the life of the head of the Duncans. Then, I secretly supported the growth of the Duncans' descendant until the day he could confront the Sanders again. Kingsley's eyes were cold. Now that Zachary had confessed everything, it did not seem to be a good thing. After all, once something that was kept a secret was revealed, it would either be because it had reached a point where it could be made public or it was so that one could die in peace. 
Kingsley remained calm. At that moment, he watched as Zachary's gaze landed on his son. He said coldly, you should know about this. Edward nodded. He knew. Since you are clear about that, you should know that it's not easy for the Duncans to get to where they are now. Every step the Duncans take is not easy. Zachary said emotionlessly. He looked a little too serious and even cold-blooded. The Duncans will not allow him to make any mistakes. Once he makes a mistake, all his efforts will be in vain. Edward was silent. In fact, he already knew what his father was going to say. Since the Duncans have mobilized so many people and caused such a huge commotion, they're prepared to succeed or die. To put it more clearly, since we've already made our move, Kingsley must die. Edward's throat moved. He had actually figured out that that would be the outcome because he could not become a threat to the Duncans. Even if the Duncans would not bear to see him die, they would still make sacrifices in the face of the bigger picture. However, that was the only way he could think of to save Kingsley, with his life. Obviously, he had lost the bet. Alex is really despicable. Nock suddenly said, his tone sarcastic. Wade's face darkened. Shut up. I'm going to die anyway, so why can't I say anything? Knox didn't listen to his grandfather's orders at all. He said without holding back, if Alex doesn't want to be the bad guy, I'll let you do it. I'll let you and Grandpa Swan kill your own son and grandson. I'm guessing that he didn't give the order to kill us, but he has allowed you to make the decision. He knew that you wouldn't ruin the Duncan's great cause for your own selfish desires, so he let you bear the responsibility of being the bad person. You still put justice before family, and Alex is still the noblest person in the entire world. The more Knox spoke, the more sarcastic he became. Wade's expression also became more and more unsightly. However, Knox did not care. You see, the people who want to kill me and Edward are you and Grandpa Swan, not Alex. We don't even have the right to blame Alex. Knox. Wade berated. I'm not afraid of death either. In any case, from the moment I was born, it was decided that I would die for Duncan's cause. I just can't understand why Alex would use such a despicable method. If he comes down now and tells Edward and me that we have to sacrifice our lives, I will die without hesitation. After all, in the face of the country's justice, feelings are nothing. I'm not that afraid of death. However, the fact that he told you to choose whether we live or die makes him not worthy of my respect. He is not worthy of Edward and me to risk our lives for him. Wade rushed toward his grandson and wanted to scold him again. Knox is right. I shouldn't have given old Master Swan the right to make the decision. When no one was paying attention, a person suddenly got down from the helicopter. It was a man. Everyone looked over and saw the man walking out with his personal bodyguards without any disguise. Other than Kingsley and Kirby, many other members of the Duncans present had never seen him before as well. At that moment, he was exposed to everyone, and his exposure meant that Kingsley had to die. That was because if Kingsley did not die, he would not be able to hide his identity anymore. Everyone knew that very well, and so did Kingsley. After all, Old Master Swan's appearance just now might have given them a chance to turn the situation around as they did hint the Duncan's reluctance to part with Fourth Master Swan. However, there was really no way out now. He just did not expect that the person whom the Sanders had spent so much energy and effort to find would actually be, right beside them. It was actually someone that Warren had taken the initiative to befriend. Warren would never have thought that his schemes would end up inviting a wolf into his house. Perhaps it was really over for the Sanders. The Duncans could deceive the Sanders and easily get close to them, 
yet the Sanders wanted to use Jean to try to destroy the entire Duncan's power. He even found the Sanders ridiculous. Mr. Thorne. The man took the initiative to greet him. We meet again so soon. Kingsley sneered. On the day he returned to Southampton City, that man had met Warren with him. The reason why Warren had brought him along was that he wanted to take a sum of money from him and pay the Hills so that the Hills would be willing to work for the Sanders. However, who would have thought that everything the Sanders had done was under the surveillance of the Duncans? Their every move was being watched closely by the Duncans. What Kingsley did not understand was. How could this man hide his identity so well? Why did the Sanders trust this man so much? Why did they trust this man? William Gates, the one who had just held a wedding with the fifth princess of the Sanders. Because I am William. William seemed to have read Kingsley's thoughts, so he no longer hid the truth. There was nothing to hide now. Kingsley's eyes narrowed. Of course, he did not believe it. After all, William was indeed the Gates' eldest son and grandson. Not only had the Sanders investigated it themselves, but Kingsley had also helped the Sanders investigate it. Since they had confirmed William's identity, the Sanders trusted him without any reservations. The man in front of her could not possibly be the real William. You're right. William seemed to have seen through Kingsley's thoughts again. I'm not the real William. The real William just died a while ago. It was when Edward picked me up and was almost discovered by your assassin that he died. When I returned to Southampton City, I came back as William. As for why I'm such a perfect copy of William, deceiving everyone's eyes, that's because I've been planning my life since I was born, on how I could use a reasonable identity to appear under the Sanders' eyes. So, I found the Gates, who are extremely powerful and rich. Of course, I'm not cooperating with the Gates. It's impossible for us to reach an agreement. Once we do, my identity might be exposed, and my death would be accelerated. I just grew up with the Gates' eldest young master in a different place. We arranged for my Duncan's loyal men to go to the Gates and record everything about William. Then, I learned, imitated, and even got plastic surgery like him. All these years, the most time I've spent was on how to act like William and how to play him perfectly until I can replace him. Alex told Kingsley everything he knew. He spoke neither fast nor slow, and no one could tell his emotions. At that moment, there seemed to be a smile on the corner of his lips. That expression that came out unconsciously was William, and it was impossible for him to be someone else. What exactly did he go through to turn someone into a person who was not related to him? They were completely indistinguishable. How much willpower and perseverance did a person need to have to turn himself into this? Kingsley believed that it was the end for the Sanders. The Sanders could never imagine how big of a game the Duncans were playing, and how many seamless things the Duncans had done in order to regain their power. I'm telling you all this so that you can die in peace and make Edward and Knox hate me less. Alex looked at Edward and said, You know very well how much the Duncans have done all these years to take back the family that belongs to us. I can't let down all the people who are loyal to the Duncans for you. I can't let the Duncan's great plan go to waste because of you. I know. Edward nodded. He knew that he was not that important. In fact, at this point, it was inevitable. Alex had been arranged to be closest to the Sanders, so he already had the ability to completely destroy the Sanders. It was only a matter of time. Edward, I always thought that you and I would conquer the world hand in hand. However, things are unpredictable. The promise we made to each other ends here. I'm very glad that you appeared in my life, and I will give you a proper burial. That was the only thing he could give Edward. All right. Edward nodded. 
It could be considered that she had accepted his kindness, and accepting it meant that he had no complaints. Alex nodded. At that moment, he looked at Knox. Knox's eyes moved slightly. He had just scolded the guy, and then he was caught red-handed. Now, he had to face it. No matter what, he felt a little embarrassed. I once told Finn that I was very envious of Edward. I'm envious that he can get married and have children normally. I'm envious that he can have a reasonable identity and go out whenever he wants. Unlike me, before I became William, I was always protected and monitored in a house. Other than the people who were with me, the only people I could come into contact with were you, Edward, and Finn. I watched all of you training desperately for me. I watched all of you constantly get injured to protect me. I've been watching you guys do a lot of things that you can't control. However, you have no idea how envious I am of you guys. I envy the two of you that you can support each other, grow up together, and become each other's most important brothers. But I can't. I can't have friends, I can't have brothers, and I can't even have emotions. I once said that I wanted to see Edward and for him to accompany me. The teacher who had guided me, taught me the art of politics, and accompanied me the most knelt in front of me for a day and a night. He said that the fact that I still had the mood to think about other things mean that he did not educate me well. He also said that I had wasted the Duncan's great plan. From then on, I didn't dare to show any of my emotions. I didn't even dare to say that you guys were my friends anymore. I even thought that if I said it one more time, you would be secretly killed. Knox's throat moved slightly. Upon hearing Alex's words, he was slightly moved even though his tone of voice sounded calm and even emotionless. That lack of emotion was true and not an act. It was an instinct that he had trained himself to have over a long period of time. Finn said that I shouldn't envy Edward. After all, he's the same as me, he doesn't have his own life. He also doesn't have his own life or the right to choose his life and death. Alex's tone was calm again as he said indifferently, even at this moment, it's the same. He can't choose to let me save him, he can only die for me. Edward pursed his lips. Knox also felt an indescribable emotion. Knox, actually, I'm still envious that his life is different from mine, that he has the company of you and Finn growing up together. You can't understand what it feels like to grow up alone in a black room, to imitate someone else's life, and to destroy your feelings. Even now, I don't want to kill you, but I don't even feel sad that you have to die. I just think that it's a pity for you to die now. You don't have to say anything. Knox looked at Alex. I've never really blamed you. I know you're tired, and I know what you're shouldering. Hurry up and give the order. I won't hate you. Alex chuckled. In fact, he did not care if they hated him or not. He said all that because if he did not say what he had been suppressing in his heart for a long time, he would not have the chance to tell them again. His fingers moved slightly before he raised his hand. That action was to order everyone to open fire at Kingsley, Edward, Knox, and Kirby. There was no need to keep them alive. At that moment, Zachary still had some emotions. The deep wrinkles on his aged face seemed to be trembling. However, he clenched his fists and suppressed his emotions. Wade was naturally the same. No matter how unruly Knox was usually, Knox was still his grandson. Her eyes were red, but he could only watch helplessly as everyone raised their guns and aimed at his grandson. At that very moment, when everybody was about to fall, Edward suddenly flipped his hand and grabbed Kingsley's gun before pinning Kingsley to the ground. The bullets flew over their heads. If they had not bent down, they would have really died. 
Knox and Kirby rolled on the ground because of Edward's actions. The moment they rolled on the ground, Kirby pointed the gun at Knox. Knox reacted quickly by grabbing Kirby's arm and firing a bullet into the sky. The next second, Kirby's head was being aimed at by a dense number of pistols. Kirby was shackled, and so was Kingsley. Edward aimed his gun at Kingsley's head with fingers trembling uncontrollably. They could not stop shaking. On the contrary, Kingsley was relieved. That was because he was the one who made Edward do it. Otherwise, he would not let Edward have his way so easily. When Alex had said those words, Kingsley had whispered in Edward's ear, Kill me. Edward suppressed his strong emotions. On one hand, he had to cooperate with Alex's acting, but on the other hand, he struggled to decide whether he should listen to Kingsley's arrangements. In the current situation, everyone was going to die. Kingsley could no longer leave, and Alex would not let Kingsley go because of Edward. In the end, they would die together, so the only choice he had was to live while Kingsley died. Edward pulled the trigger, but he did not make a move. No one stepped forward as well. Under Alex's orders, they took two steps back and left the stage for Edward. Alex was waiting for Edward to make his own decision. If Edward killed Kingsley with his own hands, he would not have to kill Edward. However, if Edward went soft on Kingsley, Edward really would have to die. Zachary looked at his son unexpectedly subdue Kingsley at that critical moment when Kingsley lost his focus. However, Edward did not shoot. Zachary held his tongue as he also knew that he could not say anything at that moment. Edward had to make the choice himself. Otherwise, he would not be able to gain the trust of the Duncans. I'll leave Jean to you, Kingsley said his last words. His voice was very soft. In fact, he was just mouthing it. However, Kingsley knew that Edward would be able to understand, and Edward understood because he nodded. After that, a gunshot sounded, and the bullet went through his head. In an instant, it passed through. He did not feel any pain as he looked at the man in front of him with red eyes. In fact, there was no need to feel sad. He once said before that everything was natural selection. If he was dead, it would be because he was not capable enough. The hills, the sanders, the duncans, and the swans would all come to an end. He was just the first one to withdraw from history. There was no need to be emotional about that, but of course, he could not dent that he still involved his emotions to choose to let Edward live. There was no reason other than the only man he could trust and protect Jean in this world was Edward. He was willing to hand Jean over to the man personally. After that, he could die without regrets. In fact, he did feel a little regretful. A face suddenly appeared in his mind, a clean face. It turned out that he was not indifferent to Lucy and that Jean was right about Lucy becoming the greatest regret in his life. Unfortunately, it was too late. If there was a next life for him to make up for this regret, how good would that be? Kingsley closed his eyes. Just like that, he died in Edward's hands. Knox had already walked to Edward's side. He looked at Edward, whose body and eyes were covered in blood. Edward just looked at Kingsley, whom he had killed. Kingsley did not even have the time to close his eyes before he died at his hands. As the bullets went through, blood splattered everywhere. He was covered in blood, and his eyes were bloodshot as he looked straight at the man in front of him. He had watched a powerful man die in his hands. In fact, many people had died at his hands. He had been raised to kill when necessary since he was young, and he had already lost count of the people he had killed. Only Kingsley made him break down mentally. Bit by bit, he had to build himself up again. He squatted there as if his entire body was frozen, 
while everyone looked at him as he suppressed his emotions. Knox looked worried. However, he did not seem to know what to say. He knew that the moment Edward killed Kingsley, Edward and Jean would really. That would be the end of their relationship. Edward had always thought that he could change his fate, but in the end, he still walked on the path of death. The empty field was extremely quiet. Alex looked at Edward and took in all of his emotions. At that moment, he even had a smile on his face. He looked exactly the same as the real William. Whether it was his expression or the marks on his face, if one looked closely, even the tiny wrinkles were exactly the same. In fact, the real William had also been killed by Edward. Many of the important matters of the Duncans had been done by Edward. Now, Edward had even killed Kingsley of the Hills, who had helped the Sanders to take over the government back then. To the Duncans, Edward was their greatest contributor. To Jean, he was her greatest enemy. Alex said, Old Master Swan, thank you for coming all the way here. Zachary came back to his senses. At that moment, he was also a little moved by Kingsley's death. No matter what Kingsley's identity was, he was still a very important and formidable character. With his death, it would still make people. Zachary sighed. Facing Alex, Zachary was very respectful. As I should. Let's go, Alex invited. Zachary nodded and turned back to look at Edward. He, too, knew what his son was hiding. However, at that moment, Edward had to bear it himself, just like how he endured all the cruelty he had experienced since he was young. With that, Zachary left with Wade. Before Wade left, he urged Knox to keep an eye on Edward. Knox nodded, but he was afraid that he would not be able to see it well. Alex took Zachary into the helicopter and left. After they left, the Duncan's men also left. During the evacuation, all the carriages of the Duncan's men were blown up. The Duncan's people, who were here to provide support, were all killed as well. It was only because those people saw Alex's true face. Therefore, they had to die. Knox looked at the burning fireballs from afar. Suddenly, he felt a little tired of that kind of life and felt like retiring from the martial world. He retracted his gaze and looked at Edward, who was still frozen in place, as well as Kingsley and Kirby, who were dead on the ground. Kirby was shot dead when the Duncans were evacuating. To them, death was too easy. Edward, have you ever thought about leaving this place? Knox suddenly asked him. Edward's throat moved, and he said, I can't leave. He originally thought that he could retreat safely after helping the Duncans accomplish their great cause. However, from the looks of it, once one joined the cause, it was impossible to walk out of it. Knox thought about it and agreed. It was not easy for the Duncans to nurture them. Unless he died, how could he escape? Let's go, Knox called out to him. The battle here was over, but there was also a bigger battlefield that he had to face. With Kingsley dead, the Sanders would be even more impatient. After all, it meant that the Duncans truly existed and had begun to have the ability and power to exist. Edward stood up from the ground and put Kingsley down on the ground. The moment he left, he closed Kingsley's eyes. He hoped that Kingsley could die in peace. Edward turned around and stopped in his tracks. At that moment, Knox's expression also changed. No one had expected Jean, who had left, to suddenly return and see Kingsley's corpse. It was a tragic sight. Then, she saw Edward's entire body covered in blood, in Kingsley's blood. At that moment, Knox did not even know what would happen. From Jean's perspective. From Edward's perspective. Knox thought that this was good too. 
In any case, they had already become enemies, so it was better to fight it out now. The next time they met, neither of them would show mercy to the other. Did you kill them? Jean asked Edward. Her voice was surprisingly calm. There was no panic, no pain, and no breaking down. She just asked Edward calmly. Edward's eyes were fixed on her. He looked at Jean, whose face was turning paler and paler because of Kingsley's death. Did you kill them? Jean asked him again. When she did not get a reply from him, she asked him again. She had indeed left. Following Mason, she had a smooth journey with Kingsley and Edward covering for them. However, the moment she left, she still turned around. She thought that since the war had broken out, and since she could not let go of Kingsley or Edward, she decided to come back and persuade Kingsley to work with Edward. In any case, their goals were similar, so why could they not cooperate? As for what would happen after the cooperation? That would be after the cooperation. She could not think too much about it now. Hence, she persuaded Mason to turn around. In fact, Ling Mike did not need her to persuade him. As long as she threatened him with her life, Mason would follow her orders. However, in the end, she was still too late. When she rushed back, she saw Kingsley's corpse. Such a powerful man was now lying in front of her, motionless. She still remembered the first time she met Kingsley. At that time, she had just woken up from a caesarean section in the hospital. The first person she saw when she woke up was Kingsley, and the first thing he said was, I'm your uncle. From then on, the word uncle had become her backing. No matter what she did, no matter how willful she was, that uncle of hers would always indulge her unconditionally. Now, that person no longer existed. She had lost another relative on top of the few she had lost. Jean walked up to Kingsley, step by step, and looked at his tragic appearance. Since she did not receive a reply from Edward, she did not need to ask anymore. In fact, the truth was obvious. Who else could it be but him? If not Edward, who else could it be? She was just, giving herself some hope. Jean slowly squatted down in front of Kingsley. Had Kingsley ever thought about the fact that there would come a day when he would die in such an ugly way? She had clearly said that she was obsessed with looks. He cared so much about her feelings, but he was still unrecognizable when he died. She stretched out her hand to reach out and grab Kingsley's hand, which was gradually turning cold and stiff. He had promised her to go home, but now, he was dead in a foreign country. Jean's tears streamed down her face. Kingsley, did I not tell you? I'm so glad I met you. When I thought that family was the most disgusting thing in the world, you were the one who made me feel the warmth of family. You were the one who made me feel that there were still family members who loved me so much in this world. The pain that Jean was enduring was becoming more and more obvious. Edward stood behind her, watching her hold Kingsley's hand as she tried to hold back her tears. She probably did not dare to release all her emotions, for fear that she would break down completely. Jean, Edward said. His voice was extremely hoarse. He had been holding himself back as much as Jean. At least, Jean could hate him all she wanted. However, he had no right to hate anyone. Don't be like this. Edward tried to comfort her. The words that came out of his mouth sounded so powerless. After killing Kingsley, he had no right to comfort Jean. What right did he have to comfort her after killing the most important person to her? He should pay with his life now. Perhaps only then would Jean be moved. At that moment, Jean asked, why aren't you dead? Why was he not the one who died in the end? Edward endured it. Didn't you say you were prepared to die? 
Didn't you say you loved me so much that you were willing to sacrifice yourself? But why did Kingsley die in the end? Jean asked him coldly. Edward's throat moved. He said, will you be happier if I die? No, Jean shook her head. But at least I won't regret falling in love with you. It was the first time Jean admitted that she loved him. It was because she regretted falling in love with him and did not think it was worth it. Edward's Adam's apple bobbed, and he continued to hide all the emotions he was feeling. He said, if I said I had no choice, would you regret it less? No, Jean said, because Kingsley is dead. At the end of the day, Kingsley was dead. The process was not important. I'm sorry. Edward apologized because it did not seem to matter what he said. In fact, there was no use in apologizing as well, but he did not know what else to say. On the contrary, Knox could not stand it anymore. He knew that once Kingsley was dead, Jean would put all the blame on Edward. No matter what happened, it would all be Edward's fault. He glared at Jean. Did you think Edward wasn't going to die just now? You're back just in time for there to be no danger anymore. Why didn't you appear a few minutes earlier? You would have known what Edward had to go through. I don't want to know, Jean said coldly. She coldly rejected all explanations. I'll tell you even if you don't want to know. The thing that Knox could not stand the most was being wronged. It was worse than killing him. He said, Edward tried everything he could to help Kingsley escape, but he failed at the last step. As for why he failed, I don't think you're stupid. You should be able to figure out that without more backup from the Hill's assassins and with the Duncans requesting constant support, no matter how strong a person is, no one can hold their own. Even when Kingsley was surrounded, Edward was still trying to save him. He wanted to use Kingsley's life to threaten Alex. That's right. The Alex that you've been looking for had just shown up with old Master Swan and my grandfather and made them watch Edward and I die. If Kingsley didn't think that it wasn't worth it for us to die with him and let Edward kill him, you would have seen Edward's and my corpses on top of Kingsley's. You'd be happier if you saw that, wouldn't you? Knox questioned Jean, that heartless woman, harshly. If not for Kingsley's conscience, they would all be dead. However, Jean did not react. It was as if she did not hear what Knox was saying. She was just silently taking in the pain of Kingsley's death and could not pull herself out of it. Just as Knox wanted to say something, the phone rang. Knox gritted his teeth and looked at the incoming call. He quickly picked it up. Grandpa Swan. Bring Edward back. I have something to discuss with you both. Zachary Swan's voice was heavy. Knox looked reluctant, but when it came to serious matters, he knew his limits. He replied respectfully, yes, I'll bring Edward back immediately. After that, he turned to Edward and said, your father has told us to go back. He said that he has something to tell us. Edward did not move. Let's go. Knox could not bear to see how badly hurt Edward was by Jean. If he had not known that Edward would be upset, he would have shot Jean to death. Knox forcefully pulled Edward back two steps, but Edward immediately pushed Knox's hand away. Knox was a little irritated. Jean was just a woman. Why would Edward torture himself like that? He watched as Edward walked to Jean's side. Give me some time, and I will give you an explanation. There's no need for that. Jean rejected. She would give herself an explanation and did not need anyone to do that for her. Edward looked at her silently and watched as she crouched down in front of Kingsley, not moving at all. In the end, he turned around and left. He knew very well that Jean would not leave. 
She would not leave Harkin or go as far away as possible because the most important person to her, Kingsley, had died here. With that, he left with Knox as he still had many things to do. Even if Jean did not need an explanation, he would still give it to her. When it was time to leave, Knox suddenly turned to Jean and said, Who do you think is the main culprit behind all this? Do you think it's Edward or Alex? Let me tell you, the one who killed Kingsley was your so-called biological father, Warren. If he hadn't detained the assassins from the hills, Kingsley would have gotten his support and wouldn't have died in Alex's hands. Edward did not stop Knox. He did not say that because Jean did not want to hear it, but Knox was not afraid to say it. He, too, hoped that Jean would know the entire story. In fact, Jean would know. Edward and Knox left together. They went to the road in the distance and drove the car that was still there from last night away from this barren place, the place where he had met up with Kingsley to save Jean. He had told Kingsley to come to take Jean away and to keep her alive at the cost of his life. However, they had failed, and as a result of that failure, he could only watch as Jean end up in the cruel war. Mason, Jean suddenly said. After Edward and Knox left, she called out to him. Yes, Mason said respectfully. Even though an assassin had seen too many cruel images, when Mason saw Kingsley dead, he was still a little, emotional. Probably no one would have thought that the head of the hills would die so easily. He had thought that Kingsley would never fall. Yet, Kingsley died in this desolate place. If Jean had not gone back on her word and rushed back halfway, Kingsley would have died without a proper burial place. She said, find out if Lucy is dead for me. Jean's tone was very calm. It was as if she had accepted the reality and was frighteningly calm. In fact, it was good that she had let out all her emotions. If she did not, no one would know what she was thinking. Mason simply nodded and agreed. With that, he left Jean's side and went to look for Lucy. In fact, since Kingsley was dead, there was no way Lucy would be alive. Based on his understanding of Lucy, he knew that she would not choose to escape before Kingsley was safe. As expected, he saw Lucy's corpse from a distance. To see such a beautiful woman die so tragically. He squatted down, picked her up, and carried her toward Jean, who was already digging with her bare hands. Mason hurried over. He put Lucy down and grabbed Jean's hand. Jean's body was covered in mud, and her hands were covered in blood. Jean, Mason called out to her. However, Jean did not react to him. Don't do this. Mr. Thorne would be heartbroken if he saw you like this. Mason stopped her. No, Jean shook her head. He's already dead. He won't be heartbroken anymore. But he died for you. Shouldn't you cherish your body more? Mason was clearly a little angry when it was usually difficult for an assassin to have any emotions. Kingsley had died for her, so what was the use of blaming Edward? He was clearly the one who caused it, but in order to let out her emotions, she said all those ugly words to Edward. She also understood what Knox just said. In fact, Kingsley's death had little to do with Edward. Other than the bullet in Kingsley's head, the other reasons for Kingsley's death had nothing to do with Edward. Yet, she could be so despicable as to hate him. If there was someone she should hate, it would be herself. She should also hate Warren, whom Knox had just mentioned. If Warren had not been so despicable, Kingsley would not have died at the hands of the Duncans. She pondered over it silently while digging Kingsley's grave with her bare hands. Mason looked at Jean and at how stubborn she was. If even Kingsley could not control Jean, he was even more helpless. Hence, he accompanied Jean and dug a grave for Kingsley. 
The hole was not very deep, but could at least bury Kingsley and give him a safe place to rest in peace. After they dug a grave for Kingsley, they dug another one for Lucy. Then, they buried Kingsley and Lucy together. She did not know if Lucy would be willing to die and still be with Kingsley, but she was selfish. She selfishly hoped that Lucy could accompany her uncle. She had a feeling that the moment Kingsley died, he might have had some regrets about Lucy. If there was a so-called hell or an afterlife, she hoped that Kingsley could face his feelings bravely and make up for his regrets in this life. After digging, Jean's and Mason's hands were already scratched beyond recognition. At that time, the sky had turned dark. Jean finally stood up from the ground and said to the grave, Uncle, I'm sorry for not being obedient. I'll avenge you. I don't agree with the survival of the fittest. I'll kill everyone who deserves to be killed. Mason looked at Jean from the side and saw the killing intent in her eyes, which she did not hide. She turned around with her back facing Kingsley and Lucy. Wait for me. I'll take you back to the Delta Islands. One day, she would bring them back to the Delta Islands. She then strode away, and Mason followed behind her. There were a few cars in the distance. Kingsley had driven them here when he came to pick her up. Once they got in, Mason started the car and asked her, where are we going? To the Sanders. Mason turned to look at her. Warren will need me. Mason nodded. Since Kingsley was dead, Jean would be the most powerful person in the hills from now. Hence, he would do whatever Jean said, and no one was allowed to disobey her orders. In the Swan's courtyard, Edward and Knox knelt in front of Zachary. However, they were not whipped according to the family rules. Zachary said, the reason why you're not being punished after making such a big mistake is that the Duncans need you now. I don't want to delay the Duncans' great cause. Edward did not react. He just listened to his father's scolding. I don't want to see you go soft-hearted on anyone else. If there really is such a person, I will kill her for you so that you will never have any more worries. Zachary threatened Edward. He was obviously talking about Jean. Edward, who was initially unmoved, immediately reacted. He said to his father loud and clear, If anyone dares to touch Jean, I'll bury the entire swans with them. I mean what I say. How dare you? Zachary slammed his hand on the coffee table beside him. There was a loud sound. Knox was shocked. Knox clutched her injured little heart. When the immortals fight, the people suffer. Do you know what nonsense you're talking about? Do you know how rebellious it is of you to give up the great cause of a country for a woman? All these years, have all the training I've given you been in vain? You didn't train me in any way. You just gave birth to me and gave me to the Duncans. When have you ever cared about how the Duncans raised me? And if I don't meet the requirements of the Duncans, you will come to me with a whip." Edward looked straight at Zachary. That was probably the first time in her life that he had talked back to her father. Wade, who was standing at the side, was also surprised. Edward had never spoken to old Master Swan like that before. You won't even acknowledge me because of Jean. Zachary's expression changed. I shouldn't have agreed to your wedding with her. Do you think you could have stopped me? Edward said coldly. Zachary's expression was extremely ugly. He probably did not expect Edward to have such a huge reaction today. He glared at his son and was about to speak when Edward immediately said, My life is yours, but my feelings are not. I have my emotions too. I can die for you, but you can't control my thoughts. I'm a human, not a machine. Edward. Zachary was so angry that he stood up from his chair. Are you trying to rebel? If I could, 
I really want to rebel. What do the Duncan's great undertaking and the nation's desire for revenge have to do with me? That's the Duncan's matter. That's your leader's matter. Why should everything fall on me? Why should I do anything? Why should I lose my freedom and humanity? From the moment I was born, my life has never been up to me to decide. Why? Slap. A tight slap landed on Edward's face. The loud noise almost scared Knox to death. He was such a bold person, but in that situation, he was as timid as a mouse. He suddenly wanted to disappear into the crowd. However, he just knelt there, not daring to make any noise, and even his breathing was careful. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Zachary asked Edward. Edward's eyes were bloodshot, and he kneeled with his back straight. His face was filled with stubborn resistance. Do you know how your mother died? I don't know. Edward said ruthlessly, I've never even met her. Why would I know how she died? Yes, she died after giving birth to me, but why did she have to give birth to me? Is it really because she loves me? Is it really? She was just leaving Alex a brother, a puppet who would die for him. Do I have to shed tears of gratitude for such a mother? Edward, shut up. Zachary had never thought that Edward would say such words. He had never thought that Edward would one day talk back at him like that. From the moment Edward was born, Edward had been trained for the sake of the Duncans. They had chosen Knox and Finn for Edward not to be Edward's companions but to increase Edward's combat ability. Everything was for the Duncans, but he did not expect to be questioned by Edward like that. His body was trembling out of anger. He was pissed off by Edward and had nowhere to vent his anger. Today, he was warning Edward to take note of his status and what he should do. He should not mess up his own sense of propriety for a woman. It was somewhat of a stalemate situation. When Wade saw that old Master Swan was so angry that he looked like he was about to die, he quickly tried to ease the situation. Edward, you have to understand your father. Your father beheaded the Duncans in order to protect the Swans and the descendant of the Duncans. Now, after so many years of persistence, there's finally a glimmer of hope for victory. Your father is also afraid of making a mistake, afraid that his own fault will lead to failure in the end. You're his son, and he doesn't want you to become a sinner. That's why he's a bit more aggressive. You have to understand. I understand where he's coming from, but has anybody ever understood me? Did anyone ask me if I wanted these things? Who has ever asked me what it feels like to be a man who can't even protect his own wife and son? Edward looked at his father coldly. He stood up from the ground. Knox was scared to death. They had never dared to get up from the ground on their own when they were punished. Without old Master Swan's permission, they did not even dare to move. The Duncan's cause is your great cause, but it has never been mine. Edward said. Then, he turned around and left. For the first time ever, he disobeyed his father's order and strode away. Edward immediately stood up and left, ignoring how angry old Master Swan was. Knox, on the other hand, hesitated for two seconds. Although he was hesitating, he felt happy. Ever since they were young, they had always followed old Master Swan's orders and had never rebutted him. Hence, at that moment, he felt so happy. He hurriedly got up from the ground and quickly chased after Edward. Wade looked at his grandson. Before he could call out to Knox, he saw him dashing away at the speed of lightning. He was so angry that he gritted his teeth. This stinky brat. Zachary was also furious. He sat back in his chair, his expression unsightly. After Wade scolded his grandson, he looked at Zachary's expression and quickly comforted him, Old Master, 
Edward is also in a fit of anger. We've watched him grow up, he won't go astray. I know. Although Zachary was angry, he knew his son's character very well. However, he just could not suppress his temper after being talked back to like that today. It'll be fine when his anger subsides. The most important thing now is how to help the Duncans push the Sanders back, Wade said. Zachary nodded his head. What I'm angry about now is finding out what kind of father Edward sees me as all these years. I've always thought that I was competent enough. At the very least, compared to my other sons, I've put more effort into raising and educating him. Edward understands. Wade said with certainty, he's just venting it out now. Old master, you have to understand Edward. Now that he has killed Kingsley, it will be difficult for him to be with Jean. Him losing his temper is a good thing too. At least we know what he's thinking now. He has to let it all out because if he doesn't, we really wouldn't know what he'll do. I've already warned him about his relationship with Jean, Zachary said solemnly. None of us would have guessed that Jean was Warren's daughter. Wade also looked helpless. If Jean had nothing to do with Warren, this matter would be so difficult to deal with. That's why what I'm most worried about now is that Edward won't be able to lay his hands on Jean. I understand, old master. However, I don't think you should interfere in Edward and Jean's matters. Edward isn't someone who doesn't care about anything. We should trust him. He's my son. I know what he'll do. What I'm afraid of is that the Duncans don't trust him. Zachary said, every new sovereign brings his own courtiers. Once the Duncans take the throne, the first thing they have to do is to eliminate those who disagree with them. When that time comes, it's hard to say. Putting aside the fact that Edward is your son, Edward is still Alex's younger brother. Wade comforted Zachary, so, there's still a chance for the situation to turn around. I hope so. Hopefully, nothing unexpected would happen. Edward returned to Bamboo Garden. He sat on the sofa without saying a word, and his expression was extremely ugly. Teddy watched from the side and did not even dare to breathe. Yesterday, after Finn picked George up, George had not returned home. Teddy had wanted to ask Fourth Master when George would be back, but for some reason, ever since he took care of George, the two of them had spent a lot of time together, and he was a little reluctant to part with George. However, now that he saw Fourth Master's expression, how could he ask the question? With that, he stood at the side and watched as Knox quickly ran into the hall. Why were you walking so fast? Knox sat down beside Edward, panting heavily. Edward did not reply. Actually, what's the use of throwing a tantrum at your dad just now? You can't really disobey him anyway, Knox said faintly. Although it felt good just now, when he thought about how his happiness was built on his brother's pain, he had no choice but to comfort Edward. Edward remained silent and sat there in the hall. Knox leaned back on the sofa, looking a lot more relaxed. I told you, you can't fall in love so easily. Look at you. You've only loved this one woman in your life, yet you're so hurt. I could see that Jean was looking at you like she wanted to kill you. The next time we meet, she definitely will not go soft on you. At that moment, Knox saw Edward suddenly stand up and leave. Just like that, Knox immediately jumped up from the sofa and quickly chased after him. He grabbed Edward, who was about to get into the car. Where are you going? It was not safe outside. After Kingsley's death and the Duncan's existence were exposed, the Sanders must have started to make a move on the Swans. There must be people everywhere who wanted to kill Edward. Edward, calm down. Knox grabbed his hand tightly and did not let go. However, Edward did not calm down. 
He suddenly pushed Knox away. Knox did not even think twice. In the next second, he stepped forward and crazily tried to restrain Edward. The two of them started fighting, and the fight was intense. Knox was, of course, no match for Edward, but he was very resilient. Even when Edward had been beaten to the ground, he was still clinging on to Edward's leg, not letting him go no matter what. Knox. I won't let you go out and court your own death. I know what you're going to do now. You're going to find Alex. There's no way Alex would meet you alone, especially at this time. Once the Sanders find out that you're meeting someone alone, that person will definitely become a suspect. Alex would rather you be shot to death by the Sanders than meet you. Knox said fiercely. In fact, he was not stupid and could figure out anything. However, he just did not want to think too much most of the time as he felt that being like Edward was too tiring for him. Edward clenched his fists. Edward, you should calm down and think about what we should do next. Knox kept hugging Edward's thigh and reminded him. Edward and Knox were in a stalemate for a long time. He had never lost control of himself like this before, no matter what kind of life and death situation he was in. If not for Knox's reminder, he might have really done something that could not be undone. Suddenly, he calmed down. In fact, it might have taken him less than 10 minutes to calm down. He said, Knox, let me go. At that moment, Knox seemed to relax, but he also hugged Edward even tighter. I'm very calm, Edward said bluntly. Once he said he was calm, he would not do anything abrupt again. Even when he was calm and he did something abrupt, it would definitely be something he had thought about carefully. Therefore, Knox let him go. Edward pulled Knox up from the ground and brought him back to the main hall. Teddy was really shocked by the fourth master. Teddy, you may leave, Edward ordered. Teddy quickly left. He was afraid that even a second of delay would cost him his life. Edward said, Knox, you're right. We should think about what we should do next. The point was. There was no way Alex would meet him. Once he had that idea, he might be killed by random gunfire on his way to meet Alex. Just now. He even wanted to discuss things with Alex from an emotional standpoint. However, in the face of national affairs, there was no place for emotions to exist. Knox endured the pain all over his body and hurriedly nodded. Since the situation has developed to this point, I think that the best way is for us, the Duncans, the entire Harkin, and even for Jean, who you're most worried about, to end it quickly. Edward agreed. That's why we should be thinking about how to speed up the outbreak of this war. Yes. Knox nodded. He felt that Edward had calmed down or rather forced himself to calm down. Edward said, the Sanders obviously know about the existence of the Duncans, but they can't find out where the descendant is. The only thing they can be sure of is that the Swans are under the power of the Duncans. Yesterday, I was able to escape and scathed from the Sanders wedding only because the Sanders still had Jean as their trump card. Now, my relationship with Jean is ruined, so the first thing he's going to do is to figure out how to get rid of the swans. Previously, Warren didn't dare to act rashly without concrete evidence because he was afraid of causing internal conflicts in Harkin. But now that he knows that the swans are a force that opposes him, even if he takes a risk, he will kill our family. Edward looked at Knox. But Warren is the leader of this country, so he can't do so many things openly. Other than using the remaining assassins of the hills to help him carry out the assassination, it's very likely that he will find a false charge and convict us.